Hello, dear misfits. I just want to thank you for 22,000 subscribers. You support really help our whole team to upscale our stories and video production. In any case, tonight will help you fall asleep with few hours of true horror stories that will give you chills. And now... Story time! Last August in 1991, I had an unforgettable experience that still sends shivers down my spine. You see, I own a cozy condo at Smuggler's Cove near Newport, Oregon, nestled amidst the beauty of nature. Little did I know that this serene getaway would become the backdrop for an encounter that defied all logic and reason. It all began when my friend, Michael, who also happened to be a park ranger, shared a chilling report with me. He had encountered something truly extraordinary at Smuggler's Cove. Eager to explore the mystery further, I decided to visit the area and witness it for myself. I arrived at my condo, situated near a tranquil lake, accompanied by my sister April, her husband, and their young son. The peacefulness of the surroundings set the stage for an idyllic vacation, or so we thought. One evening, as the sun began to set, we gathered on the balcony, enjoying the breathtaking view of the lake. Suddenly, something caught our attention. A figure emerged from the dense foliage on the opposite side of the lake. It was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Towering and robust, this creature appeared to be a Bigfoot. The creature possessed no discernible neck and was covered in long, jet black hair, which swayed with each powerful stride it took. As it walked along the edge of the lake, it seemed to move with an uncanny grace, despite its immense size. The sight was both mesmerizing and terrifying. As we stood there, awestruck, our initial disbelief transformed into a shared sense of awe and bewilderment. It wasn't just my own eyes that witnessed this enigmatic creature, my sister April, her husband, and their son were equally captivated by the sight before us. Time seemed to stand still as we watched the Bigfoot navigate the surroundings with an almost supernatural presence. Its existence defied all rational explanation. We were witnessing a phenomenon that challenged the boundaries of our understanding. Our hearts raced, and a mix of fear and fascination gripped us. We exchanged nervous glances, realizing that our lives were forever changed by this encounter. It was a moment that would bind us together in a shared secret, forever etched in our memories. In the days that followed, we tried to make sense of what we had witnessed. It was a beautiful summer day, and my family and I decided to have a picnic at a scenic spot known as Deadman's Pass located off the old highway near 84. Little did we know that this innocent outing would soon turn into a spine-chilling encounter that would test the limits of our understanding. As we settled down and began enjoying our meal, one of the kids noticed a figure across the ravine in a small meadow near the forest line. At first, we thought it was a black wolf, peacefully observing its surroundings. Intrigued, we focused our attention on this enigmatic creature, curious to see its behavior. For several minutes, we watched in fascination as the figure remained motionless, swaying back and forth. Its dark silhouette against the backdrop of the meadow made it difficult to discern its true nature. But then, something extraordinary happened that shattered our assumptions. The figure stood up, towering over the landscape, and that's when we realized it was no ordinary animal. It was massive, easily measuring at least 11 feet or even taller, and it moved in a peculiar manner, somewhat stooped over. Its sheer size and posture defied any logical explanation. In awe and disbelief, we witnessed the creature take a few giant strides, disappearing into the dense woods just to the right of its position. It covered a considerable distance in just a few steps, something that no bear could ever accomplish. It was a sight that left us breathless and filled with a mixture of wonder and unease. Being born in Washington, I had heard tales of a mysterious creature known as the Dogman. I had even seen the Patterson-Gimlin film, capturing a similar being. What I witnessed that day in Deadman's Pass bore a striking resemblance to those accounts and the iconic footage. 
The encounter played over and over in my mind as we packed up our belongings, an air of excitement and trepidation lingering around us. It was a rare glimpse into the hidden realms of the unknown, leaving us with more questions than answers. Later, I couldn't resist sharing our experience with a park ranger who was stationed nearby. Their face grew serious as I described what we had seen. They listened intently, acknowledging that our encounter aligned with other reports they had received over the years. I'm a ranger in Yosemite National Park, and I believe I've witnessed something that people refer to as a real-life alien spaceship. I even had the audacity to touch it with my bare hands. It was a few years back when I was still quite new to the job, on May 7, 2003, to be exact. I was assigned to patrol an area due to reports of strange sounds being heard every night past midnight. There were also rumors of dazzling light shows resembling full laser displays. Some speculated that teenagers were having parties in the woods as the reason behind these noises, but deep down, I knew that explanation didn't make any sense. A couple of rangers had already been investigating the case, but with little progress. That's when I was added to the team. At 23 years old, full of enthusiasm to solve the mystery, I delved into every aspect of the investigation. I meticulously gathered testimonies from witnesses, surveyed the entire area, and tracked possible suspects. I even started camping in the suspected sites. Night after night, I immersed myself in the darkness of the woods, becoming intimately familiar with the creatures that emerged when the sun set. I witnessed unexplainable phenomena, an unexplained disappearance of a human right before my eyes, insects glowing with a mesmerizing flicker of light. I documented everything, but unfortunately, in 2003, phone cameras were not as accessible as they are now. So, I had no clear evidence of these extraordinary occurrences. It was during the last night at the final location on the list when everything changed. As the clock neared 5, I was setting up camp when suddenly, all my gadgets emitted strange static noises. Initially, I considered the possibility of equipment failure and thought about heading back. But something felt off. The day before, everything was functioning perfectly fine. Nonetheless, after a few minutes, the strange static ceased, and everything returned to normal. With little hope of finding answers, I shared my discoveries with my fellow rangers. Some believed me, while others laughed it off. To those who believed, they mentioned having witnessed similar phenomena but failing to find any trace of it upon returning to investigate. It seemed to appear and vanish in the right place at the right time, defying rational explanation. With a glimmer of hope, I returned to the exact spot where the specter had presented itself. I moved around the area, searching every nook and cranny, but to no avail. It was truly gone. As I sat down to have my dinner, the full moon cast its radiant glow, illuminating the surroundings. Lost in my thoughts, I caught a sudden flash of light in my peripheral vision. It was momentary, but it showed me the way. Intrigued, I followed the direction of the light, and soon enough, my walkie-talkie began emitting an intense, unsettling static noise. Fearing it might alert whatever entity was responsible. I swiftly turned it off. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, I scoured the area until, finally, at around 10 p.m., I stumbled upon an awe-inspiring sight. Before me floated a colossal structure resembling an egg with rings like Saturn, slowly ascending into the night sky. Its metallic surface emitted an otherworldly glow, reflecting the moon's light. I hid behind a nearby tree, my heart pounding in my chest. This was it. This was the revelation of an unseen side of our world, and I was an astonished witness to it. Crouching down, I observed the object with bated breath. It hovered, surrounded by its rotating rings, an enigmatic spectacle. It was pitch black, and its presence emanated a deep engine like rumble. I marveled at its presence, captivated by the sheer magnitude of the moment. Suddenly, the stillness shattered as the outer shell of the object began to crack. The rings on its surface emitted a neon blue light, 
reminiscent of an ethereal glow. It was a sight beyond comprehension, defying any earthly explanation. My eyes remained fixated on the spectacle as four metallic pipes extended from the craft, acting as sturdy supports. It stood there, frozen in place, and I dared not make a sound. Time seemed to blur as I crouched there, overwhelmed by a mixture of awe and fear. Hours passed, but nothing else transpired. The cracks on the surface of the object closed, returning it to its original form. An eerie stillness settled over the surroundings as the craft slowly began to rise, its presence dominating the night sky. Driven by curiosity and a thirst for answers, I mustered the courage to approach the vessel cautiously. Every movement was deliberate, as I crawled on all fours, avoiding any unnecessary noise. With each painstaking inch, I drew closer to the enigmatic craft, anticipation surging through my veins. Finally, I reached out, extending my hand to touch the metallic surface. The sensation was surreal, a smooth, cool texture beneath my fingertips. It was a moment of connection, a tangible encounter with the unknown. However, as I prepared to caress the craft, a high-pitched noise pierced the air, reverberating through my eardrums. The intensity was overwhelming, causing me to clutch my ears in agony. The next thing I knew, I awakened in a hospital bed, disoriented and bewildered. I had been found unconscious by a fellow ranger and rushed to the hospital when I failed to regain consciousness. The details surrounding my sudden collapse remained a mystery, but I knew deep down that my encounter with the otherworldly craft had played a part. Since that fateful day, I've become even more determined to uncover concrete evidence of their existence. The encounter, the warning signal of the high-pitched noise, and the subsequent disappearance of the craft all reinforced my belief that these beings walked among us, observing from the shadows. They were aware of our presence, and perhaps, they had become more cautious, making their activities less frequent and conspicuous. Armed with my conviction, I continue my search for proof, hoping to share my extraordinary experiences with those willing to listen. The encounter with the alien ship had forever altered my perception of the world, reminding me that there is still so much left to uncover. As a ranger in Yosemite National Park, I stand as a guardian of the uncharted, forever vigilant, and forever seeking answers to the mysteries that lie within the vastness of the unknown. In late 2001, as an officer patrolling near Las Vegas, New Mexico, I found myself in a mountainous rural area, surrounded by the stillness of the early morning. My partner and I sat inside our fully marked police cruiser, parked by the roadside next to a dense thicket of dark woods. Daylight was just beginning to break, allowing us to see clearly through the windows without the need for headlights. As we engaged in conversation, my partner diligently filled out paperwork, oblivious to the imminent encounter that was about to unfold. It was approximately 5 a.m., and the world was slowly waking up around us. Suddenly, our attention was drawn to movement at the edge of the bushes, where there was no discernible path or roadway. With bated breath, we watched as a massive figure emerged from the undergrowth, making its way toward us. The creature had four legs, hoofs pounding the ground, but what struck us most were its long, muscular arms swinging back and forth, resembling the movements of an ape. In the short span of time it took for the headlights to circle through the windshield, the creature covered a distance of about a hundred yards. Our hearts raced as we realized the sheer size of the entity. Standing at least eight feet tall, it loomed over us. Reacting instinctively, my partner and I leapt out of the car. He reached for his firearm while I, opting for a non-confrontational approach, cautiously moved towards the creature. It seemed to recognize my lack of aggression and swiftly disappeared into the depths of the surrounding woods, moving with an uncanny agility on all fours. Driven by curiosity and a sense of duty, I ventured into the same woods, hoping to track the elusive creature. To my surprise, there was no trace of any disturbance or evidence of its passage through the dense brush. It was as if the creature had vanished into thin air. 
There was no sign of human tracks or any indication that someone had sprinted through that very spot. It was a baffling mystery, leaving me with more questions than answers. In my quest for understanding, I reached out to fellow officers in neighboring towns, and they shared similar reports of a wild man roaming the area. Other accounts emerged, speaking of startled horses and the discovery of large human-like footprints in their vicinity. Our department devoted significant time and resources to tracking down the elusive creature, but our efforts proved fruitless. It seemed that our encounter was a fleeting glimpse of a phenomenon that defied explanation. As the days turned into weeks, the creature remained elusive, fading into the depths of local folklore. It became a tale shared among law enforcement and the local community, an enigmatic presence lurking in the memories of those who had witnessed it. While we never laid eyes on the creature again, the encounter served as a reminder of the mysteries that lie within the vastness of our world, waiting to be unraveled. I was deep in the wilderness, backpacking with my faithful dog, miles away from civilization. It was just the two of us, surrounded by the serene beauty of nature. We had encountered no other hikers throughout the day, making the solitude even more pronounced. In the dead of night, around 2 a.m., my dog's growl startled me awake. I quickly turned on my headlamp and saw his teeth bared, his instincts on high alert. Something was amiss. I strained my ears and heard heavy footsteps approaching our tent. The possibility of a black bear or a moose crossed my mind. Taking swift action, I leashed my dog, ensuring he couldn't charge through the tent. As I did so, the footsteps receded but continued to circle around our campsite. Confusion clouded my mind, I had properly stored all food and toiletries in a bear bag, eliminating any potential attractants. I clapped my hands, hoping to deter whatever was circling us. Yet, the slow, deliberate movements persisted, behavior more peculiar for a human than a moose or a bear seeking food. Gathering my courage, I made a decision. Gripping the leash in one hand and clutching bear spray in the other, I stepped out of the tent, raising my voice and shouting, Hey bear! The footsteps abruptly halted and my dog's keen senses directed my attention to the right. However, my headlamp revealed nothing. There was no sound of a retreat, only an eerie silence. Giving it a few minutes, I cautiously returned to the tent, still on edge. But before long, the unsettling circling resumed, approximately 50 feet away from us. It continued for what felt like an hour, a constant reminder of an unseen presence lurking in the darkness. Eventually, the footsteps wandered off into the depths of the woods, disappearing with the dawn. As morning broke, I decided to investigate. Equipped with my dog and the bear spray, I began searching for tracks. Amongst the fallen leaves, I discovered a clear path that had been trampled, but no discernible footprints. My dog's nose led us further, tracing the loop around our campsite. And there, in the midst of nature's splendor, I came across a chilling discovery. A few unmistakable human footprints, bare and of regular size, adorned the ground. It was clear that someone, a stranger, had ventured into the remote wilderness, intruding upon our solitude and encircling my tent for over an hour. Adding to the eerie revelation, a human turd and scattered toilet paper lay as evidence of their presence, a disturbing reminder that an individual, possibly with malicious intent, had violated the sanctity of the wilderness. In early February, an intriguing tip came my way, hinting at a series of astonishing encounters with none other than Bigfoot in Elk County. Eager to delve deeper into this mysterious phenomenon, I seized the opportunity to interview two witnesses who had experienced firsthand the presence of the elusive creature. What I uncovered during those conversations left me both astounded and captivated. One resident, who wished to remain anonymous, shared a remarkable account with me. He revealed that he had been actively placing scrap buckets filled with an assortment of food, apples, berries, and corn, near the edges of the woods, hoping to provide a feast for the local wildlife. 
Little did he know that his generous act would soon lead to an encounter he would never forget. On the fateful evening of his encounter, the resident found himself in his cozy home, enveloped by the tranquility of the surrounding forest. Suddenly, a distant sound of heavy, thunderous footfalls pierced the stillness, causing his curiosity to awaken. Recognizing that the rhythm and weight of those steps did not match the gait of an elk or deer, a sense of intrigue mingled with a touch of apprehension settled within him. A few minutes later, his outside security system alerted him to movement near the vicinity of his property. With a mix of anticipation and trepidation, he peered out of a nearby window, straining his eyes to discern the source of the commotion. What he witnessed next defied all logic and reason. Standing before him was a colossal figure, towering between eight to nine feet in height. Its entire form was enveloped in a thick cloak of black and gray hair, rendering its true features partially concealed. The creature's imposing stature was such that the window frame itself obscured its head from view. The witness's heart raced, and a sense of awe washed over him, realizing he was in the presence of something truly extraordinary. The creature possessed an immense wingspan, its shoulders broad and robust. Its long arms swung rhythmically with each calculated stride, a testament to its untamed power. With measured grace, it moved away from the property, disappearing into the depths of the surrounding woods. The witness stood transfixed, the weight of the encounter settling upon him, forever etching this remarkable sight into the depths of his memory. I'm a born and raised Long Islander. So are my parents. They met out east, which an islander talk means the east end of the island. To any NYC rich kids, that means the Hamptons. But for the rest of us who are coincidentally not millionaires, it means the North Fork. Not to get too geographically confusing, but Long Island is an, accurately named, Long Island that forks off about a three quarters of the way down the 90 miles it stretches. It kind of looks like a fish with its mouth open, with the North Fork being where the eyes are and the Hamptons are the jaw. Shelter Island is somewhere in the middle. Like, a smaller fish about to be eaten. My mom's family had a summer house on the North Fork. My dad had a house on Shelter Island. My parents met working at a summer job, and the rest is, clearly, history. But super long explanation short, I grew up getting to pretend to be bougie, because I had not one, but two summer houses. I know, right? Shelter Island is my favorite place. In a lot of ways, just the island itself feels magical. The only access is by ferry, and while traveling there you feel like you are being transported into a different world. But the picture of Shelter Island in the summer is very other than the winter. In the summer, the population rises to around 20,000 people. But in the winter? Not more than 2,000. So, I was around 13 or 14. I had invited my best friend to come out with my family that weekend. I was so excited, as it was one of the first times she was able to. I remember our bathroom was being renovated, and so the only other bathroom we could use was in the dank, dark basement, and the only connection to the house was by going outside and down the stairs and then down another set of stairs into the basement. So, it had to have been around 10 o'clock and we went together to the bathroom to brush our teeth. The moon was almost full, so bright it provided some lights on an island that street lamps were few and far between. If it wasn't for the light of the moon, we probably would have passed the creature altogether without realizing it because out there you can hardly see two feet in front of you when it's dark. As we were coming back up the stairs, laughing about something menial, was when we saw it. It was about 10 feet away, with its back to us, lurking near my shed. We both froze and did that thing where you take a quick breath and hold it, involuntarily. That made the creature notice us. Its head whipped around, and his eyes were glowing, a kind of blood red. It didn't look angry, but rather like a feral dog, not knowing how to react to these two teen girls observing it. Almost as if not to scare us, it slowly rose up to full size, which I would guess was around 7 feet. The whole time, 
It never broke eye contact. I felt I could fall into the pits of blood that its eyes were. It was covered in long shaggy black hair and had thick human-like legs. After standing there, frozen in horror, for at least a full minute, all the while still in this staring contest, we both regained control of our feet and ran up the stairs screaming for my parents. We saw a werewolf, we saw a werewolf. My dad went out first, and we followed. My dad quickly dismissed it and went back inside, a bit disgruntled. I could have sworn I saw a bush where it was near move. Over the years, I've had many theories. One of which is that the native people who lived on the island before the white man are responsible, as shapeshifting legends are prevalent in indigenous people's cultures. Maybe, it's the descendants of the people who stole this land, cursed to turn under the full moon, choosing isolation to protect their secret. For nine months out of the twelve, anyway. A couple weeks ago my dad shared the below. My dad is about as down to earth and grounded as they get. Him, his then high school girlfriend, his best friend with girlfriend in tow, and another male friend would drive out to the back roads. The roads we're talking about are pretty desolate, could go through the night without seeing another car. They would randomly stop put on some tunes, and do what teens do. This is the late 70s as reference. One night they stopped and were hanging out, when in the field about 500 yards away a total of five lights shone spaced about 50 yards from each other and roughly 20 feet off the ground. My dad said they all just stared because the lights were so brilliantly bright, but really did not hurt the eyes. Roughly 15 seconds after being on they went off without a sound. They all were discussing what it was when once again the lights came on again. This time they noticed three people, standing about 50 yards in front of the lights, just standing no movement. Lights turned back off, my dad said they were not scared since it seemed so far away from them. Lights go back on, the initial three people have moved up roughly 50 yards, and there is now five more behind them, 50 yards. Like bowling pin arrangement. Lights back off. At this point while still kind of watching, my dad and his friends are packing up to nope out of there. The lights come back on, and there is the initial eight people still in the same position, but now one single person about 200 yards away right in the middle of the light spectrum. That was it they floored it out of there. No one looked back, and it was never spoken of amongst the friends. My dad said if it was some sort of production to spook five high schoolers, it was well accomplished. All this happened within a three to five minute period of time, as reference. I had to ask did you see the lights for a fourth time while driving away. He said they were all so shook up, they would not have even noticed slash did not want to see them again. In late February, amidst the enchanting landscape that straddles the border of Westmoreland and Indiana counties, my senses were ignited by a sighting that would forever alter my perception of the supernatural. It was an early morning, around 7.15 am, when the world was still cloaked in a tranquil embrace. Little did I know that I was about to become a witness to another worldly encounter. I found myself in a remote, rural area near the Chestnut Ridge, surrounded by a serene stillness. As I cast my gaze toward a weathered building, a peculiar sight caught my attention. Behind the structure stood a diminutive figure approximately four feet tall, draped in a shroud of gray hair. It resembled a small Bigfoot, but there was something subtly different about its appearance. Mesmerized by this enigmatic creature, I began to notice a curious phenomenon unfolding around me. Echoing through the air, emanating from the depths of the nearby woods, came a series of haunting whoop-whoop sounds. Each resonant call sent shivers down my spine as if beckoning the smaller creature to answer its cryptic summons. Without hesitation, the diminutive being sprang into motion, its agile form darting toward the origin of the haunting calls. I stood there, rooted to the spot, as the mysteries of the unseen world unfolded before my eyes. The boundaries of reality seemed to blur, leaving me suspended between awe and trepidation. Two days later, 
on that very same property, a new chapter in this unfolding tale of the extraordinary was written. A putrid stench, reminiscent of rotting meat or decaying eggs, permeated the air, weaving an atmosphere of unease. The odor lingered for what felt like an eternity, tainting the very essence of the surroundings, before gradually dissipating into the ethereal abyss. As if responding to this unholy scent, the resident's faithful canine companion fell ill, overcome by a mysterious malaise. The once vibrant and eager companion now cowered in fear, refusing to venture beyond the threshold of the familiar. It was as though the tendrils of an unseen force had ensnared the very spirit of the faithful creature. This remarkable series of events became a chapter in the storied history of this enigmatic locale. The whispers of previous encounters between beings akin to Bigfoot echoed through the annals of time, intertwining with the tapestry of legends and folklore that had woven its way into the fabric of this land. As I reflect on my encounter, I am left with more questions than answers. My best friend and I worked overnight security at a Waffle House in 2002-ish. He was tall, lanky, and had a death metal vibe. I was wide, stout, and bearded like a dwarf. We looked like badasses. We were not. We waited in line for Harry Potter 4 and attended a weekly vampire the Masquerade LARP. We were not badasses. The reason this particular Waffle House required such lackluster security was one town over. The stretch of Tulane that passed by our Waho connected one dusty country-ass town to a dustier, though slightly less country, town. Hick Town A had a considerable black population. Hick Town B had the nearest dance club, everything else in between was cowboy whiskey halls. Every weekend night at 2 a.m. everyone who had made the pilgrimage to Hick Town B for healthy doses of alcohol and ass passed by the Waho and we filled to capacity until 4 a.m. For the most part, the presence of security was an overreaction from a Hick Town Waho owner. We were busy, but there was rarely any kind of trouble. Sometimes words would be exchanged over the counter. We'd stand up, the rowdy customer would say, man, F this place. And leave. By the time they got to our counter, everyone was pretty partied out and just wanted something scattered, smothered, covered, chunked, and diced before they passed out. One night, things got scary. My buddy Ray and I were sitting by the jukebox, on our sixth Whitesnake song because it was the only thing on the machine that didn't twang. Around one a young interracial couple came in. Cute kids, late teens, nice customers. About 10 minutes after the kids came in, a pack of white supremacists walks in. This was before 2016. This was when white supremacists still stayed in their holes and hadn't yet aligned with a political party. They were rare. You only saw them in prison shows and Ed Norton movies. But here they were. Six of them. Cliché tattoos and all. They sat at the bar, backs to the door. Their shirts were adorned with slogans that made a civilization cry. Ray and I looked to the manager for some kind of silent message. We were a little worried. We weren't worried because they were there. We weren't worried because there was an interracial couple sitting 20 feet from Nazis. What worried us was that it was 1.30. In 30 minutes our establishment would be hosting, on average, 40 young, drunk, Black men and women who live every day under the weight of the continuous oppression and sour demeanor of Southern hospitality. Those men and women will open our doors and, through a haze of smoke and Hennessy, see white power shouted at them six different horrible ways from the backs at the bar. It was going to get ugly. There was going to be blood. But based on the way we expected the 40 versus 6 fight to go, we weren't sure we were going to get involved at all. The boss came and sat with us for a moment. We had a little meeting, kind of a fight coordination. I'd get fat ass on the ground, Ray would pop dad across the nose, the kitchen was there for backup and they were ready to dive in. We waited. The kitchen double timed their orders in hopes of getting them out quick. The kids got their food. They ate calmly, casting the occasional nervous glance. The filth got their food. They ate calmly 
casting the occasional hateful glance. The filth stood up, dropped a bunch of cash, and left. It was 1.57. Five minutes later the customary trickle of stumblers who were the definition of young, dumb, and full of cum came pouring in. Five minutes. Those hillbilly men were five minutes away from dying. I've always wondered if they meant to start shit and just chickened out or if they just got lucky and left at the right time. Either way, the moment they left was one of the biggest reliefs of my life. I'll never forget that night, even though, in the end, nothing happened. I and my wife live in a mid-sized city in a fairly populated area in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania just off a very busy main road. This happened around June or July of 2022. We mostly live around older people and college students, and rent is very cheap as it's not the nicest neighborhood. My wife's job is a five-minute walk from our apartment and she was getting home very late that night, around 1.30 a.m. She came in looking scared to death and eventually told me she saw the following. She said there was a small humanoid running out from between ours and our neighbor's house. It was dressed like, and had the proportions of an approximately four-year-old child, and wore a striped shirt and pants. She said he stopped, appeared to be a boy, and looked in her direction briefly, before running off between another house. The child appeared to have a potato sack or burlap sack over his head, it was possibly drawn on. She is a major vibes person but she has never said anything like this before, though she has excellent instincts. She didn't get a sense it was evil, but she was terrified after. If I bring up the child she gets freaked out and won't talk about it. No small children live on our street and there are regular gunshots slash screaming slash angry homeless guys that we are very accustomed to after three years of living here. In short, it's not a place an approximately four-year-old child would be out alone at 1.30 am. She also did not tell me what happened right away, she appeared scared but talked about work slash unrelated things before telling me that. I think she thought I would judge her slash tell her she was lying. It never happened again and I have never seen or felt anything. If anyone has any theories I'd love to know. It freaks me out to think about it, especially because that house he ran from is owned by a bachelor and has an enclosed, gated backyard. So I spoke to her again about it. She said that it was strange because the door to our next door neighbor's backyard was closed, and it seemed to go through the door. She said it ran in an unusually playful manner and seemed scared only when it stopped to look at her. It actually ran to the opposite side of the same house, which I got wrong the first time. From her report, it did not run like a child but had a quick playful movement, sort of like a rabbit. It made no sound or movement to indicate distress, other than running skipping? Away quicker than a child would. She felt it was an internal sense that it was paranormal and that she saw something she wasn't supposed to should not continue. If it has to have a face to be a humanoid I apologize, I wasn't aware honestly, and was trying to learn about the story. This is Pittsburgh. No the bag covered the child's entire head, but she did say that the burlap bag may have been drawn on. Like two little X's over the eyes, but not a full face. She did not glimpse the skin color or cannot remember from shock. It didn't speak or make any sound that she can remember, it just ran. This happened on a backwoods creepy highway road somewhere between Georgia and Florida, in the 80s. My family has always been a Midwestern road trip family, since dad does not like flying. When I was a preteen we took one of many road trips to Florida, and mom slash dad both would drive for the entire 24 hours, just to stop to eat and take breaks slash gas. I have always been a light road sleeper, and wake up for anything. The reason why this story sticks with me so well is that it is one of the only times I've seen both my parents show signs of being scared, something as a kid I really never saw. In the middle of the night I remember waking up to my parents talking about something, in a concerning tone. The windows were open, since we were far enough south now to be out of crappy November Midwest weather. Once I wake up, 
They both stopped talking so I sit up thinking they were arguing or something and that I stopped it. I look out the window and see nothing. Just, like trees and fields, the moon, and electrical poles. But nothing, no houses, no other cars, nothing nothing nothing. I ask where we are and my mom actually says, I don't know. So now I'm really like, WTF. I say, are we lost? And they both just say nothing. And then I hear music, like our car radio playing, but it's coming from outside. Just loud enough like it's a car next to us, but we are the only car on the road. But, not loud enough to make out the exact song, it's just music. And my parents are listening to it too, all quiet. So I say, where is that music coming from? And there is a pause and my mom finally says, I don't know. So I say, is it our radio? And my mom says no. And then suddenly my dad says very, very calmly, wife, roll up your window. And my mom practically has a heart attack getting the window rolled up. I went back to sleep somehow, but I had no idea what was happening, and my dad drove faster. On the same trip we saw a couple with a trailer hitching up a car behind them, but it was hitched up in a way that it looked like an invisible person was driving. My parents thought that was so hilarious and then redirected any mention of the phantom music to that part of my trip. So, I've never fully gotten 100% the true story. I hope you enjoyed. I have other weird forest creepy encounters too if you would like more. A friend and I came across this amber-eyed creature on April 15, 2023, in Patterson, Texas, Waller County. It was around 11.30 p.m. when we cut through Morton Road. We backed out of that dirt road so fast and then drove south on Durkeen and the left onto Royal Road while the entire time looking over to the open field with our spotlight and the one rifle in the truck. Once we made a right onto 362 and headed south, we began feeling a bit more relaxed. We then took it all the way south to 359 and then made a left on Highway 90 and didn't stop till we made it to our friend's house. We were coming from Patterson, Texas where one of my other friends lives. We also like to go through that patch on Morton Road during the day because it is like off-roading. We originally thought of heading to Royal High School on Royal Road but we instead decided to turn left and off-road at night when we drove past Morton Road. It is the reason why we were so chilled about coming across what we thought was a large dog till it turned around and stood on two legs and growled at us. Its growl was deep but low, it rattled the entire truck. One of my friends told me that the only thing they remember was the sound it made while breathing which was that of a horse. My buddy's truck is lifted and usually, when I stand in front of the hood, it is around the high part of my chest, I'm 5 feet 8, but when this thing stood up, you could see most of the waist area so it had to be taller than me. I can't give an exact measurement because I just don't know. All I know is that it wasn't a bear. I've seen black bears before. The spotlight caught it and it looked like my buddy's German Shepherd with amber looking eyes. Maybe it was a big Kai dog or Koi wolf or a bear with mange, but it was pretty tall and wide. It happened so quick. So we put it in reverse and got the hell out of there and drove all the way to Katie without stopping anywhere. Then we barricaded ourselves in it with AR-15s and shotguns, sitting there in the middle of the dark with our backs to each other for the rest of the night. We didn't leave the house until midday on Sunday to check the dashboard camera which had recorded over the entire incident the previous night. Our cell phones recorded nothing but jumble and my buddy's dog wouldn't come near the truck as it kept whimpering around it with its tail behind its legs. The dashboard camera recorded all the data on Sunday. We went through it and it was from when the truck was parked at our friend's house. The cell phone quality was so bad we erased it. I dropped my phone on the floor of the truck and didn't find it until Sunday afternoon. It is not something we were planning for like most of the videos you see on the web. Monday morning came around and we all call in sick because we refused to get out of the house until the sun was out. This obviously upset our parents who thought we were being irresponsible and we finally grew the courage to return to Morton Road on Monday afternoon. 
Our six trucks enter Morton Road off Durkin Road with high-powered semi-assault weapons, shotguns, and hunting rifles. We didn't find any tracks either which is weird because it had rained heavily the past few days so the ground was soft and there was standing water on Morton Road. The only thing we found was this perverse stench like something had died mixed with metallic smell, blood, and urine, ammonia. The dogs we brought with us, two German shepherds and two others were all whimpering nervously around the site like they didn't want to be there. After the incident, I spent the rest of April just reading everything I could about dog man encounters. My other three friends don't want to talk about it either and one broke up with his girlfriend of three years because he just refused to spend the weekend hiking with her through the attic's reservoir hiking trails. They got back together after we were able to get him to open up about it, but I'm the only one that has put this out to the public. It has been a month and I still refuse to be out later than sundown. I don't leave the house early in the morning anymore to go to the gym at 5 a.m. In fact, I have changed my life around completely and that includes no more before bed walks at night with the dog. I have installed security bars on all my first floor windows, added spotlights to my entire home, and places better security cameras. I also no longer drive through country roads even during the day, especially by myself because I feel exposed. Last week I refused to go fishing on the Brazos River and turned down heading for the weekend to Lake Conroe. I've always wanted to go fishing at the end of East Matagorda Bay, but to get there one would have to off-road on a 4x4 west from Matagorda Beach on a dirt trail for about 15 miles. Yet after this experience, I no longer feel safe. I just want to go back to being ignorant about the things that go bumping about at night. I grew up in a very rural area. As a kid, I do a lot of exploring. Once when I was about 11 and my brother was 8, we were riding our bikes down an old trail on the edge of our neighbor's property. We frequented abandoned dirt roads often, so we knew if we just kept following the trail, we'd eventually end up at the main road, about a quarter of a mile from our driveway. We came across an old red iron lean too. There were cow carcasses hanging from the top post in various states of decay. This spooked us and we got out as quickly as possible. We really didn't speak about it after that but both still explored. I had found a house when I was about 16 or so but never had the courage to go in. It was about 2 miles behind our neighbor's 22 acre property line. I didn't really worry about it because of how far and I didn't want to go that far out on someone else's land like that again. Now here's where it gets weird. At 22 me and two other friends got drunk and decided to go exploring. I knew how to get to this house because there's a trail. It's overgrown from years of neglect but it's still a viable trail. We get to a clearing and there's the house. There is a rusted 50s oic up truck parked beside the home. It's white wood and still in pretty decent condition. The lawn was shorter gras, almost like it was fresh cut and it looked like they needed to weed eat around the truck and house. I didn't think much of this at the time. We don't plan to go in at first. We walked around the back and saw there was a whole trailer behind the house. The two were connected by a crudely made awning and porch. We could see the back door of the house and the front door of the trailer were both open. One quart glass jars were everywhere. I mean dozens. Some on the ground under the porch, a lot on the platform. There were so many, they spilled out of the trailer and house. Most were empty but some had a clear liquid. We decided not to enter the trailer because that seemed to be where the majority of the jars were. We were unsure of broken glass and assumed the liquid was moonshine as it wasn't growing algae like some of the others. We go through the back door and find the house was in disarray. Paper everywhere, tons of water damage. The roof and floor were caving in in some places. I found a calendar from 1973 hanging. Old toys and books were just scattered. No seating or bedding furniture but there were a couple of tables and a desk. The craziest thing I found was a box within that desk. It contained pencils, blank papers, a how to write in shorthand book and some records. 
The records show large sums of money being paid not only to the local school but also to several people. The area I grew up in is a lot of old money slash generational wealth people and I recognized many last names. One of the names I recognized was my 70 something year old landlords. The sums of money were anywhere between 50 and 6,000. The larger amounts were paid to the school and frequently too. They'd get a check at least once every week, sometimes twice a week. Never for less than 1,000. At this point, one of my friends found a plate and glass on the kitchen table. It was dirty like it had food on it at one point. There were dirty dishes in the sink too. This kinda weirded us out so we left at this point. It's been about 10 years since that day. A few weeks ago, I'm shooting the shit with my dad at about 2 in the morning. We were talking about living there for so many years and how we had so many memories. With it being so late, I felt a little spooky so I told him about the house. I did not tell him about the Resieps. After hearing my story he kinds nods and says, yeah, that's Mr. Cup's house. I had never heard of this dude in the 20 something years I've lived in this house. The more I got to thinking about it, the more I felt like I remembered that name on the records. I asked my dad how he knows about the house and apparently, when we were little kids, my parents had too much to drink one night and took some of their friends out there to go ghost hunting. He saw pretty much the same thing I did. He told how he gets to the location and I realized the road I found those carcasses on as a kid was one of Mr. Cup's driveways. The other came out about a quarter of a mile to the opposite of my house. I then told him about the Resieps and our now deceased original landlord's name on them. He tells me he doesn't know about all the Resieps but he does tell me that way back in the 50s, Mr. Cup and our landlords where it ends about where the property line was. Mr. Cup had proof of his side of the land. The landlord had filed a motion to stall the lawsuit and eventually, after years of fighting, it was settled that the property Mr. Cup was living on was theirs. Some of the details in regard to why Mr. Cup didn't get his land are fuzzy to my dad. He does know that the landlords didn't tell Mr. Cup Ty he had to vacate because they didn't want him to appeal. So for about 10 years they let him live there and didn't mess with him. At this point, he's in his 70s and it's in the 1970s. The landlord gave Mr. Cup's property, in addition to a lot of property behind our neighbor's acreage to her daughter as a wedding present. They forced Mr. Cup to pay them in order to stay. The daughter used the money to fund a clubhouse in the middle of the property. They also redirected his access road, the trail, to lead to the clubhouse. This went on for some time until the couple who were now in possession of the property decided to divorce. The guy was the brother to my little brother's best friend's dad. His family home was right down the road from all this. He managed to win all the property in the divorce and the wife got the money. The first thing he did was go to Mr. Cup and sold him not only his property back, but also all the property that was originally the landlord's. Including the property the club was on. So Mr. Cup closed off all access to the club and the access point furthest from him. He left the one closer to his home open. Then what? I had asked my dad. He shrugged. Nothing, he lived a few more years and then died. They found him at the kitchen table a few months after he had passed. I don't know who owns this property now, nor do I know who has been maintaining it. The only other person in this area with that last name spelled it different and was not originally from the area. I know nothing else about it. I don't even know what was in those jars. I think about this sometimes and the more I think about it the more questions I have answers. It was a cold evening in January 2023 in Navajo Summit, Arizona. I had my two nieces with me, one was six, the other eight. I had gone to our family cabin, waiting on my sister to return from town. The evening started at about 7 p.m., and we didn't have a key to the house. We waited for a couple hours, and the girls eventually fell asleep in my truck. As the night continued, the temperature also dropped. I fell asleep as well. I woke around 9.30 p.m., it was very cold in the truck. I started the vehicle. 
As I depressed the brake pedal to start the truck, I noticed in the side mirror a face looking at me from the glow in the tail light. I hesitated to look at first but gathered enough courage to observe it again. I saw a white face, with long gray slash white hair, and black eyes, looking at me. I freaked out. Once I started the truck, I sped off and headed to the highway, not sure if what I saw was following us. It was. I continued down the highway in a panic. After a few minutes, I felt as if something had jumped into the bed of my truck. I turned west to head towards a town called Ganado. I went as fast as I could to my parents' house. Upon reaching the turnoff, I felt it jump out of the truck and watched the same white-haired entity run along the right-of-way fence. As I pulled up to the house, I quickly carried my nieces inside. Once inside, I situated the girls for bed. Later that night, I dreamed that I walked about two miles to my aunt's house. No one was home. As I walked back home, I noticed this same white-haired thing paralleling me. I quickly ran home, went inside and locked the door behind me, and then went to bed. As I woke the next morning, I noticed sand and dirt at the foot of my bed. I told my parents of what had happened, and of what I had dreamed. Since we are native Navajo they took me to a medicine man and he told me that I actually sleepwalked to my aunt's house, and when I entered the house, it followed me in. Totally freaked me out. Did I encounter a skinwalker? The medicine man refused to answer my questions, but my father is still vigilant and believe that I was the target of a native witch. I have been working on cleaning up a property that I recently purchased for a lakeside cabin. I've spent the last three weekends there since the purchase. So far has just been junk removal and cleaning but I've brought a lot of tools and some general supplies as well. Almost as soon as I started cleaning I noticed messes I didn't make or things knocked over. I have a fairly large pile of, of junk wood and garbage outside and every morning it's all flipped over like someone has been going through it and moving everything around. On my second weekend out my circular saw went missing after I forgot it outside. I am on a fairly large property, 23 acres, and there's no neighbors for a good distance. I got pretty worried that there could be squatters on the property so I set up a trail cam outside pointed towards the trash pile. The Sunday night I heard a huge slam and then what almost sounded like a young girl giggling. After that there was nothing. I went out to find trash moved all over. A bucket was moved at least 20 feet and I found some little gold bracelet put inside of it that was not there before. My trail cam is gone but it sinks to the cloud through a cell network so I was able to get the single picture it took. I literally have no idea what to think or do. The first thing I noticed is the raccoon or something similar standing over the bucket just staring at the camera. Even though it's kinda creepy I felt relieved that it's just an animal. Then yesterday I noticed the face behind. What the F is that? Seriously what am I looking at? Is it a person? A doll? A child? Someone in a mask? I'm scheduled to head back tomorrow morning for the weekend again but I just need some answers. I saw an alien in my room and showed them a meme. I wrote this account six months ago because I needed to get this story off my chest. This experience was starting to affect my relationship and I desperately needed to tell someone and move on. I decided not to go through with posting about it because I didn't want to seem cringe or have a bunch of people tell me that I was lying. Fast forward to today and I'm finally feeling brave enough to share. Context, I'm female. I was 22 at the time and in my last year of engineering school, still living in my parents' house. Since then I've moved out and got a job in another city. Back in April 2022 I was laying in bed relaxing and had drifted off to sleep around 1am, I'm a night owl and typically stay up well into the night. Sometime after I fell asleep I was awakened by someone grabbing me from behind in an awkward hugging motion. Like a bear hug but more awkward and grabby. I slept on my side and would usually face the wall, so I needed to turn around to see who was touching me. My mom usually gets up for work super early, 
so I assumed it was her coming into my room to hug me and say bye for the day. I was horribly wrong. When I started to turn around, my vision was still blurry, and I couldn't see anyone standing directly next to my bed. I was confused because I had just felt someone touching me. Before I had even finished fully turning to see, my eyes had wandered to the corner of my room near my desk, and my body froze immediately. There was this unknown being floating directly above my desk. I'm not even sure if being is the right word to use, but it looked humanoid. This being was slightly shorter than me, I'm 5 feet 3, had a larger than normal head, and a tiny slit mouth, and their skin was this blackish, star-speckled color. I don't even know how to describe it, but they almost looked airy, like if I poked them my finger would go right through. I felt like I was looking into some sort of cosmic gas. It was really strange, but the most prominent feature I noticed was their gigantic, deep black eyes. The eyes somehow managed to be a deeper black than their skin. They were so huge and just very striking to see. When I saw them hovering over my desk, I made eye contact and my whole body froze. My immediate instinct was to get up and run away, but it was like I couldn't move my arms and legs no matter how much I thought I needed to. I was frozen still. A strange detail I remembered the other day was that when I made eye contact, all the ambient noise in the room was gone. It was completely silent, and we were just staring deeply into each other's eyes. It was like time completely frozen at that moment. While I was staring into their eyes, I felt something I had never felt before. I felt the most primal fear I could have ever felt. I felt like I had suddenly reverted into a caveman or something. I felt this horrible dread, a horrible terror. I kept thinking that I needed to get up and run, I needed to get away, but I couldn't move. And then I heard this message in my head. I can't exactly describe how I heard it. It wasn't as if someone said it to me, but as if it was directly planted into my own thoughts. It said, don't be afraid, and I thought to myself what in the world is going on? I was confused because I heard this message but the being itself did not speak. Like their mouth didn't move. In fact, I don't remember any sort of facial expression ever being conveyed other than the creepy intense stare. I felt a sort of calmness wash over me and I blacked out a few moments after that. The next thing I remember is being seated at my desk. The being was gone but I could still hear these messages in my head. I'm assuming they realized how scared I was and decided to hide themselves to avoid me freaking out again. I can't exactly remember the entire conversation word for word, or how it even happened, but I remember the gist of it. Basically, I was shown these images of real life war, maybe the war in Ukraine? And images of war in things like cartoons and media, and I guess it wanted to know my opinions about both and the way the images made me feel. I can't remember my response but I remember feeling that they were mildly satisfied with it. For a moment I felt like there might have been a third presence in the conversation like someone else was observing, but I'm not completely sure. At some point during the encounter, I felt awkward and I grabbed my phone to look online, just looking for something to calm myself down. Nobody was in the room but still, I felt like I was being watched intensely. It's worth noting that I have very severe social anxiety, and I was scared, but I didn't feel like I was in danger anymore. Anyway, I ended up finding some stupid meme and laughing at it, and I got a feeling like the being was questioning my behavior like they seemed intrigued by the way I was acting. I remember holding my phone up in the air like look. Not knowing where they were but trying to show them anyway. There was a moment of silence, and then the next thing I know I was back in bed again like nothing ever happened, in the blink of an eye. My phone was lying next to me on the bed, and the screen was off. I grabbed it to look at the time. It was like 3 or 4 am. I checked my tabs to make sure I wasn't insane, and sure enough, the last page that I had been on was still open. I don't think they liked my meme. After this happened, I felt like I had been severely traumatized. I slept with the light on for several months after this happened. I talked about it constantly, so much so that I started to overwhelm my girlfriend with my behavior. I was paranoid all the time, 
I couldn't fall asleep without checking that same corner over and over again. I spent months researching other people who've had similar encounters, just trying to convince myself that I'm not crazy. I still do feel paranoid a lot of the time, and sometimes I convince myself that it wasn't real and I was just dreaming, sleep paralysis, but my body knows the truth. I still feel that horrible dread feeling when I think about what happened, especially when I think of looking into their eyes. My hands will shake and I start to sweat, my body goes numb. It's the only thing that keeps me 100% sure that it wasn't just a dream. I still find myself checking corners when I'm in bed at night, but it's gotten a lot easier to manage now that some time has passed. This experience has completely changed the way I see reality and consciousness, and definitely made me ask myself some tough questions about our existence on this planet. Hey there, let me share some intriguing experiences I had growing up in southern New Hampshire, particularly in East Derry. My childhood home was situated on a quiet cul-de-sac, with a police captain and a detective as our neighbors. Living in that house was eventful, to say the least, with a multitude of strange occurrences tied to its very essence. One of the most peculiar phenomena I encountered was the presence of a shadow person, manifesting itself in the likeness of my family members. Even years later, after we had moved away, my older brother confided in me, saying, whatever it was, it seemed to have taken a liking to you. This brings me to one of the many stories I have from that time. My best friend, who lived just five houses down, had parents who owned a pop-up camper. It was parked to the side of their porch, with its door serving as the family's main entrance. Being curious 12-14 year olds, we often had sleepovers in the camper with other kids from the neighborhood. During one of these nights, we had an experience that continues to haunt me. On this particular occasion, it was just my friend and me. As girls of that age, we would often bicker over trivial matters. That night, it was about a piece of gum she threw to me, which ended up getting lost between the mattresses and the lining of the camper. She was unwilling to give me another piece, which sparked a heated argument between us. As we went back and forth, our voices growing louder, an eerie silence suddenly enveloped us. Out of nowhere, we both heard the distinct sound of footsteps pacing around the camper. Then came the voices. It's difficult to put into words, but it felt as if someone was whispering right beside us, yet the voice carried a strange distance. It was a male voice, speaking in a language we couldn't comprehend. We exchanged worried glances, and I recall my friend hastily taking off her socks, they were new, fuzzy, and mine, we didn't want them getting ruined, you know. Without further ado, we sprinted the 15 feet to the side door, hurried inside, and raced up the stairs to her room, clutching the house phone along the way. Given that her parents were heavy drinkers, we didn't want to disturb them. So, we did the only logical thing and called my house instead. My mom, concerned for our safety, drove around the neighborhood twice, but upon returning, she assured us she saw nothing out of the ordinary. We were so spooked by the incident that we decided to sleep on the floor next to each other. It just so happened that our sleeping spot was beneath the window overlooking her front yard. Before we eventually drifted off to sleep, we both distinctly recall hearing the sound of raking or digging. This story dates back nearly 20 years now, but to this day, I remain friends with my childhood best friend. Whenever I recount this tale or any of the other strange occurrences from that time, she can always vouch for me. We shared an unexplainable bond during those unforgettable years. Indeed, East Derry seemed to be a hub for bizarre happenings. Numerous peculiar events took place in that town, leaving an indelible mark on our memories. It was January 14th of this year 2023. I was on my way to work so it was approximately 5.35-45 am and was a light rain and dark. I was coming from Hammond, Indiana heading west on 165th which turns into 159th. 
I was between State Street and Wentworth Avenue in Calumet City, Illinois. So when I saw it, I was now in Illinois after passing State Street. I was in the left lane and there was only one car in front of me in the right lane. This car was about six car lengths ahead of me. This is a wooded area and I saw something alongside the car in front of me by the rear. As I said this is a wooded area and I am always watching for deer, raccoons, and opossums. I looked harder and watched and thought to myself is that a deer it's running fast. Then I realized there was no way it was a deer. It looked bigger. Like I said it was a light rain, dark, and had my wipers on. I started to speed up because I had no clue what this was at this point. As I got closer whatever it was went directly behind the car in front of me, suddenly had a huge wingspan, and went up and over my car. I talked about it for weeks telling everyone how it was very unsettling and it's all I thought about since that morning. I take the same route to work Monday to Saturday and I'm always on the lookout and haven't seen anything since. It wasn't until months later my sister shared on Facebook that she found out if you go to Google Maps and search Mothman that the locations of sightings show up. At that moment it all clicked in my head and I literally said out loud holy shit it was F Mothman. My husband was confused and I showed him her post and he laughed. But from that moment on I was confident and positive that's what I saw. I'll never forget my time serving in the Coast Guard, especially the eerie moments that reminded me just how mysterious and unpredictable the sea can be. One particular incident stands out vividly in my memory, leaving me with a lingering sense of awe and unease. It was during my watch's helm and lookout, a crucial responsibility while out in the vast expanse of the Bering Sea. We were miles away from any signs of civilization, surrounded by an endless stretch of water. As I steered the ship, I suddenly noticed a pronounced blip on the radar behind us. It appeared out of nowhere, catching the attention of the officer of the deck. The officer called up to me, the lookout, to report what I could see. However, due to the ship's superstructure, my field of vision was obstructed directly aft by the exhaust stacks. I strained my eyes, trying to make out any details, and that's when I saw it, a disturbance in the water, a weight trailing behind something. But just as quickly as it appeared, it vanished, disappearing beneath the surface. The radar blip disappeared too, leaving us with more questions than answers. We could only speculate about what had caused such a phenomenon. The possibility of encountering a sea cryptid, like a kraken, crossed our minds. The idea sent shivers down my spine, reminding me that even in the middle of the vast ocean, we were not as alone as I had presumed. The unknown depths held secrets that defied our understanding, lurking just below the surface. Another unsettling incident occurred during a mid-watch in the dead of night. The darkness enveloped the ship, and a thick fog blanketed the calm seas, obscuring our vision. I handed over my post as the lookout to another crew member, and as he relieved me, he casually remarked, Man, sure is spooky out there. From that moment on, I couldn't shake off the feeling of being watched. Every time our foghorn sounded, its echoing blast amplified by the fog, I couldn't help but jump, my heart racing. The tranquil atmosphere, combined with the thick curtain of fog that swallowed everything beyond our navigation lights, heightened my senses and stirred my imagination. Despite knowing we were completely alone, the silence and isolation played tricks on my mind. Adding to the eerie ambience was the fact that I was serving on the Coast Guard's oldest ship, a vessel with a rich history and numerous ghost stories circulating among the crew. These tales, whispered in the dark corners of the ship, further fueled my imagination and intensified the sense of the unknown. I had always been drawn to stories that defied explanation but little did I know that my journalistic curiosity would lead me into a world of intrigue and mystery. As a newsman in West Virginia, I found myself venturing into Braxton County, where an unusual incident had unfolded. News had spread of an airplane crash in the area, piquing my interest. I made my way to the site, 
hoping to uncover the truth behind the peculiar event. As I arrived, a sense of tension hung in the air, and I could see a small crowd gathered around the wreckage. Approaching the scene, I noticed a man standing nearby, clad in a suit that seemed out of place for the rural surroundings. His appearance caught my attention, high cheekbones, slant eyes, and dark skin that hinted at a foreign origin. Intrigued, I approached him, hoping he could shed some light on the situation. With a calm demeanor, he assured me that no one had been hurt in the crash and that no crime had been committed. His words perplexed me. How could such an incident occur without any consequences or investigation? Something didn't add up. Curiosity getting the better of me, I noticed a small, metallic object lying on the ground near the wreckage. It seemed insignificant, almost like a trinket or a toy. Without thinking much of it, I picked it up and slipped it into my pocket. Perhaps it could serve as a clue in unraveling the truth. As night fell and the world around me grew quiet, I found myself restless at home. The events of the day lingered in my mind, the unanswered questions gnawing at my insatiable curiosity. It was around 3 am. When a sudden knock on my door shattered the silence, jolting me from my thoughts. Opening the door cautiously, I was taken aback to find an army officer standing before me. His appearance mirrored that of the man at the crash site, the same high cheekbones, slant eyes, and dark skin. It was as if they were cut from the same cloth. Without hesitation, the officer demanded the return of the metal thingamajig I had picked up earlier. Surprised and caught off guard, I reluctantly handed it over to him, my mind racing with questions. How did he know I had taken it? And why was it of such importance? The army officer thanked me sternly, his expression revealing nothing. With the object back in his possession, he turned and left, disappearing into the night as mysteriously as he had appeared. Left standing in my doorway, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets this strange artifact held. As the morning sun gently streamed through my window, I had no inkling that my life was about to take an unexpected turn. At exactly 7 am, a knock on my door interrupted the tranquility of my morning routine. Curiosity peaked, I opened the door to find a man dressed entirely in black standing before me. His sharp attire and serious demeanor immediately grabbed my attention. He wasted no time in introducing himself and ushering me towards a sleek black Buick sedan parked nearby. Something about his presence exuded an air of secrecy and urgency. Without exchanging many words, we embarked on a journey to a nearby cafe. Once seated, he began to speak with a captivating intensity, recounting an extraordinary sighting he had experienced the previous day near Tacoma, Washington State. The images he painted were so vivid and detailed that it felt as though he had transported me to the very scene of the sighting. He described six peculiar objects, donut-shaped and unlike anything he had ever seen before. His words were laced with a sense of awe and trepidation, as if he had stumbled upon a secret that demanded utmost discretion. It was then that he made a chilling statement, urging me to remain silent about the incident if I truly cared for my family's well-being. His words hung in the air, and I couldn't help but feel a knot of unease forming in the pit of my stomach. Who was this man, and why was he sharing such sensitive information with me? The gravity of the situation became all too real. Days later, as I attempted to make sense of the encounter, I found myself faced with a devastating turn of events. Two Air Force intelligence officers, Frank Brown and William Davidson, who had been involved in questioning me about the sighting, tragically lost their lives in a plane crash on their return to base. The timing and circumstances were far too coincidental to ignore. Then, fate struck again. Kenneth Arnold, another investigator involved in unraveling the truth behind the sighting, experienced engine failure during a flight back home. Forced to crash land, he narrowly escaped with his life. The pattern of inexplicable incidents unfolded before me, weaving a sinister tapestry of danger and secrecy. Rumors began to circulate, attempting to discredit the authenticity of my encounter. 
Some claimed that I had admitted to fabricating the entire story. However, a teletype from the Seattle FBI Special Agent George Wilson to J. Edgar Hoover shed light on the truth. It stated that I had not admitted the story was a hoax, but rather mentioned the possibility of claiming it as such to avoid further trouble. As a park ranger, I've become immune to many weird and strange occurrences in the woods. Unnatural looking animals, strange figures, and even paranormal phenomena have become a part of my everyday life. The rule I follow is simple, as long as I don't interfere in matters that don't concern me, I'll be safer. Most of the time, this rule works, but sometimes things get far too real and far too scary. I belong to a group of rangers stationed in a remote corner of the park, surrounded by a vast forest. Last week, something happened that I can't simply ignore like I usually do. My partner, whom I'll call Carlos, and I had patrol duty for the night. We had recently been relocated to a cabin where many rangers had stayed in the past. It was a decent little space with two adjoining rooms and a small bathroom. Luxury was the last thing on my mind in the middle of nowhere, especially considering the nature of our job. Around 7 p.m., after having some tea and reading the news, we put on our gear and left the cabin. With not many rangers stationed nearby at the moment, we had a lot of ground to cover. I personally enjoyed walking in the dark, finding it strangely peaceful. It had been scary in my early years as a ranger, but over time, I found solace in the tranquility it offered. I once asked Carlos if he preferred patrol duty in the dark, but he didn't care for it. Most people wouldn't. As we walked, I observed the thick, tall trees, the moist brown soil, and the cool breeze, the holy trinity of good vibes, in my opinion. I would have liked to listen to some music, but it tended to make me drowsy, so I settled for the random noises of the night. The wind oscillated between sudden gusts and gentle breezes, creating a rhythmic symphony of rumbling leaves and crackling bushes. We walked in silence for an hour before getting bored and engaging in some small talk. Carlos began by cracking pathetically lame jokes, which eventually transitioned into sharing horror stories. Despite his orthodox background and belief in the paranormal, his stories were genuinely spine-chilling. Around 2 or 3 in the morning, we sat down on a fallen tree. I took out some juice, but it felt unnaturally cold for the weather. The condensation on the outside surprised me, I didn't remember bringing them that cold. Looking back, it should have been a major red flag. As we shared more stories, Carlos was in the middle of telling a particularly eerie tale about a flying vinegar-dipped vampire from the Philippines when I heard a groan. My instincts told me it was the sound of an injured creature, but it didn't feel like an animal. It sounded human, like the grunts of an older woman in pain. The groan was distinct, and both Carlos and I jumped up from the log simultaneously. He had heard it too. I nodded at Carlos, and he pointed his flashlight in the direction of the sound. The groan came again, a little more distant this time. I called out, but there was no response. With my right hand on my firearm and my flashlight in my left, I followed the direction of the voice, repeatedly calling out. The groan echoed once more, and we increased our pace. I led the way, while Carlos hurriedly trailed behind, continuously calling out, Hello? Is anybody there? After a minute of walking, we discovered the source of the voice, a short, pale old woman wearing a black cape. She was facing towards us but looking straight down, mumbling something. Her appearance sent shivers down my spine. She was bald, and her skin was a dead-looking dark blue. Her cape was tattered and baggy, and there was an unmistakable sense of unnaturalness about her. But in the off chance that this was a human in need of help, we were obligated to assist her. Carlos approached the woman cautiously, asking if she was hurt. When she looked up, I saw something that chilled me to the core. Her eyes were pitch black, devoid of any humanity. They seemed empty, as if there was nothing behind them. Her skin, too, had an eerie, lifeless quality. It was then that I noticed her mouth, a gaping, 
ear-to-ear gash on her face. In that moment, everything within me screamed that this wasn't a human being. The unnaturalness of her appearance sent waves of fear coursing through my body. The woman, or whatever she was, suddenly pulled up her hood and shifted her gaze toward me. Without speaking a word, she transmitted something to me telepathically. And then, in an instant, she vanished into thin air, as if she had disintegrated into nothingness. I stumbled backward, feeling a mix of disbelief, terror, and confusion. Was this encounter with an alien or a demonic entity? I looked over at Carlos, and his face was paler than I had ever seen it before. He knelt down, audibly whispering a prayer under his breath. It took me a while to find the strength to get up, my legs still trembling violently, but somehow they still functioned. We made our way back to the cabin, following the markers on the trees. Once inside, I poured some hot tea while Carlos sat at the table with his head in his hands. It was around 5 am, and I couldn't help but feel the weight of the traumatic encounter we had just experienced. I mustered up the courage to talk about what we had seen, but Carlos remained silent, unresponsive to my inquiries. Seeing him in that state made me realize the profound impact this encounter had on both of us. By 9 am, I decided to contact my superior and inform them about the incident. However, their response was dismissive, questioning if we had been drinking on the job. Frustrated, I hung up, realizing that we were on our own in dealing with this strange occurrence. We had broken the rule, interfering in a matter that concerned us, and now we had to live with the consequences. Despite the trauma, Carlos and I couldn't resist the pull of the forest. Night after night, we returned to the woods, still following the rule in hopes that it would protect us. This job meant everything to me, and I didn't have a plan B but deep down, I couldn't shake the fear of encountering that sinister presence again. I tried researching the incident, hoping to find some reference or explanation. It reminded me of the legend of La Llorona, a weeping ghost from Mexican folklore. Whatever it was, whether an alien or a demon, it radiated an undeniable evil. Why it chose to reveal itself to us, I may never know. All I hope for now is that I never have to see it again, and that the rule we've abided by for so long will continue to keep us safe. New Orleans, 2005. I remember that night vividly, as if it happened just yesterday. I was a police officer responding to a call about a possible break-in at the home of an elderly deceased person. Little did I know that this was just the beginning of a series of bizarre encounters that would shake the foundations of our beliefs. As we investigated the case further, another call came in. Two suspicious individuals were spotted prowling around a boarded-up house near the swamps. My fellow officers and I rushed to the scene ready to confront any potential threats. We approached cautiously, our hearts pounding with a mix of anticipation and fear. In the dim light, we saw them, two men dressed in black suits, standing ominously in the shadows. Without hesitation, we made the decision to confront them. But when we fired our weapons, they vanished into thin air, leaving no trace behind. It was as if they had simply melted away, defying all logic and explanation. We scoured the area, searching for any sign of their escape route, but found nothing. It was as if they had never existed in the first place. Confusion and disbelief filled our minds as we tried to comprehend what we had just witnessed. Weeks later, another unsettling incident occurred. A man claimed to have been abducted by an unknown creature. He described them as tall, pale figures with no hair their faces resembling skulls. Despite their otherworldly appearance, there were enough human-like features to distinguish them from any known creature. According to the witness, they attempted to communicate, but their language was incomprehensible, a jumble of sounds that defied all linguistic understanding. The encounter left him bewildered and shaken, struggling to make sense of the inexplicable. Officer Mike Farrell, a senior member of the New Orleans Police Department, expressed his frustration in finding any information about these creatures online. 
He knew that the accounts of these encounters would be met with skepticism and disbelief without concrete evidence. As the reports continued to pile up, each one more baffling than the last, it became clear that there was something extraordinary happening in the swamps of New Orleans. Strange sightings, unexplained phenomena, and a sense of unease permeated the air. One particular incident shared by an off-duty officer sent chills down our spines. He had witnessed a fellow officer disturbed by an encounter during their shift. They had been dispatched for a welfare check on an elderly woman, but upon arrival, the house appeared untouched. No signs of forced entry or any indication that someone had been there. Curiosity got the better of them, and they decided to keep an eye on the property. To their astonishment, they noticed a light flickering in one of the windows, despite there being no visible connection to any source of electricity. Determined to investigate, they rushed inside, only to find an empty house, devoid of any signs of life. As they resumed surveillance outside, the officer's attention was drawn to movement in the shadows. Two figures emerged from the darkness, one tall and imposing, the other small and mysterious. They watched in disbelief as the figures approached the house, but before they could react, the figures vanished into thin air, leaving them perplexed and filled with an eerie sense of dread. Something inexplicable hung in the air that night, an electrical charge that added to the surreal nature of the events unfolding before us. These encounters defied all logical explanation, leaving us questioning our understanding of the world and the presence of forces beyond our comprehension. To this day, the strange occurrences around the elderly woman's missing case, the unexplained lights in the house, and the enigmatic figures that haunted our thoughts remain unresolved. I still remember the day I first set foot on the grounds of West Point, the prestigious United States Military Academy. The campus, with its gothic castle-like buildings, exuded an air of both grandeur and eeriness. As an aspiring army officer, I was ready to embark on a journey that would test my limits physically, mentally, and spiritually. Being a cadet at West Point meant living in the barracks, which were more like ancient structures that seemed to have stood the test of time. Assigned to the infamous Lost Fifties Barracks during my sophomore year, I found myself in the midst of stories and legends of ghostly encounters. It was said that the spirits of fallen soldiers roamed the halls, their presence felt by those who dared to stay up late studying or succumb to sleep deprivation. As an engineering student, my days were filled with demanding classes and rigorous training. Sleep became a luxury I could rarely afford and the constant exhaustion blurred the line between reality and imagination. The creaking floors, the mysterious noises, and the occasional slamming of doors all became part of the background noise in my sleep-deprived existence. I shrugged it off, convinced that even the ghosts would have to wait their turn if they wanted to haunt me. Fast forward to 2011, and I found myself deployed to the unforgiving terrain of Afghanistan. It was a harsh reality, a far cry from the hallowed halls of West Point. My best friend and college roommate, who shared the same dreams of serving our country, was tragically taken from us in an ambush. Grief consumed me, and my mind couldn't help but wander into the realm of the supernatural. The day after his death, I had a dream, a vivid encounter that felt both surreal and hauntingly real. In that dream, my friend and I had a conversation as if he were standing right beside me. His words echoed with an otherworldly wisdom as he warned me of the dangers that lay ahead. Watch out for IEDs, he said. When the road turns to loose dirt, you need to be vigilant. I woke up, shaken to the core. Was it just a dream born out of grief and guilt? Or was there something more to it? Despite my skepticism, I couldn't ignore the lingering feeling that his message held significance. With a heavy heart and a newfound sense of caution, I prepared for another routine convoy security mission. As we traversed the dusty Afghan roads, I couldn't shake off the image of loose dirt under our wheels. And then it happened, a deafening explosion, shattering the calm of the surrounding desert. Our vehicle had struck an eyed, and chaos erupted. Amid the chaos and the smoke, 
I found myself relatively unharmed, save for a few stitches and a renewed sense of awe. The dream, my friend's warning, had come true. It was as if he had guided me through the darkness, protecting me from the very dangers that took his life. In the aftermath of that fateful day, I couldn't help but reflect on the mysteries of life and death, and the thin veil that separates them. The Lost Fifties Barracks, with its alleged hauntings, seemed to hold a deeper meaning now. Perhaps the spirits of those who had gone before us were not mere tales or figments of imagination, but guardians watching over us in ways we could never fully comprehend. My army career continued, forever marked by the memory of my fallen friend and the unexplained events that unfolded. Life taught me that there are forces beyond our understanding, and sometimes, the supernatural intertwines with our reality in ways we can only begin to fathom. And so, I walked on, with a newfound respect for the mysteries that lie beneath the surface, ever vigilant and ready to face whatever may come. So there I was, stationed in Afghanistan during the years of 2011 and 2012. It was a tense time, as we constantly monitored the predator feeds, eagerly anticipating the start of our shift and the missions that lay ahead. Little did I know that this particular day would bring forth a series of events that would leave us all in awe and disbelief. As we watched the feeds, our attention was immediately captured by the sight of a motorcycle speeding through the rugged Afghan terrain. It carried three individuals, one of whom had a bag over their head, facing backward, Instantly, a wave of concern washed over us, as we realized we were witnessing a kidnapping unfold right before our eyes. We braced ourselves, fearing the worst, witnessing a fellow human being meet a tragic end. The motorcycle came to a halt near a cluster of trees, breaking the illusion of Afghanistan as a desert landscape perpetuated by the media. The captors led the hooded figure out of their sight, and he was forced to kneel on the ground. Time seemed to slow down as we anxiously awaited the next moments, filled with dread and helplessness. But to our astonishment, instead of carrying out a gruesome act, the captors unexpectedly lifted the hooded man back onto the bike. Confusion mingled with relief as we watched them speed towards the nearest town, our anticipation mounting. As they arrived in the heart of the town, our anxiety peaked once more. The motorcycle screeched to a halt, and the captors pushed the man against a wall. What could their intentions be? Our minds raced with speculation, fearing the worst. Then, something utterly unexpected unfolded before our eyes, a seemingly ordinary ice cream cart was pushed into view. The captors removed the hood, revealing the face of the kidnapped man. To our amazement, they handed him the ice cream cart transforming him from a victim to an unexpected purveyor of frozen treats. As if scripted, the once captive man began moving through the town, selling ice cream to the locals. Confusion swept through our ranks, mirroring the disbelief we felt within ourselves. The situation had taken a surreal turn, leaving us questioning our assumptions and perceptions of the world around us. I was just 20 years old when this extraordinary incident occurred, right here in Sao Paulo State, Brazil. It was the year 2017, and my friend Tiago invited me to spend a day at his father's place, located just outside Jacutinga MG. Excited for a new adventure, I accepted his invitation, and together we embarked on an unforgettable journey. We arrived at Tiago's father's house on a beautiful Saturday morning. The day unfolded splendidly, filled with laughter, good food, and enjoyable activities. We relished a mouth-watering barbecue, took refreshing swims, savored delicious fruits, and engaged in meaningful conversations. Later in the day, we even lent a helping hand to Tiago's father as he pruned some trees. It was a truly enjoyable and bonding experience. As the sun began to set and darkness veiled the surroundings, Around 8 p.m., Tiago's father requested that we leave. With his old-fashioned Fiorino pickup truck, we embarked on our journey back. Tiago and I settled in the bucket seats, with our backs to the rear window,
gazing backward as the truck moved along. We had covered about a kilometer when Tiago's father slowed down to pass through a tunnel. Suddenly, we noticed a towering black figure rapidly approaching from behind. Initially, I thought it was a large dog, its eyes gleaming in the darkness. In that moment, confusion and fear engulfed us, and we exchanged bewildered comments about the mysterious creature. It stood on the precipice, resembling a person, gazing intently in our direction from a distance of approximately 40 to 50 meters. The encounter left us utterly terrified and perplexed. As we locked eyes with the creature, it swiftly shifted back onto all fours and descended the ravine, heading towards the road. It reached the roadside with remarkable speed, bounding across the entire width of the road and leaping into the opposite ravine. Jago exclaimed, that's a werewolf. To our astonishment, the werewolf continued to pursue us, mirroring our path through the woods. Leaves and branches were sent flying, the snapping of twigs resonated through the air, and we glimpsed the creature maneuvering effortlessly among the trees. Jago urged his father to accelerate, revealing that something was relentlessly tailing us. The father inquired, what is it? To which Chago responded, I think it's a werewolf. Finally, we arrived at a river and crossed a narrow bridge. Strangely, the werewolf did not follow us across the river but remained on the riverbank, steadfastly watching our departure until it disappeared from sight at the bend in the road. This encounter shattered my disbelief in the existence of werewolves, despite hearing stories from my parents and grandparents. From that day forward, I have been apprehensive about venturing into the countryside at night, harboring a newfound respect for the unknown. The memory that etched itself most deeply in my mind was the creature's astounding leap, effortlessly traversing the road from one side to the other. Reflecting on the incident, I realized that had it not been for the river, that ferocious werewolf might have pounced onto the Fiorino Uno, eager to seize us. Now, I cautiously avoid nighttime journeys to the countryside, mindful of the cryptids and mythical creatures that may lurk beyond the safety of the city's embrace. My name is Joe Crop, and I find myself entangled in a peculiar situation involving a cryptid that I am desperate to learn more about. But more importantly, I need to connect with anyone willing to explore its lair. Allow me to share the second-hand information that has led me to this point. I hesitate to label my cousin as a liar because he is an honest and trustworthy individual. However, strange occurrences have plagued his property far too frequently. Synced car alarms blaring simultaneously, animals mysteriously vanishing without a trace, and pole lights flickering on and off randomly, despite receiving a clean bill of health from the electric company. These are just a few examples. More recently, something has taken to walking on his roof. Multiple witnesses have attested to hearing the eerie footsteps. However, whenever someone investigates, the presence vanishes without a trace. It dawned on me that it might be utilizing the caves in the sinkhole adjacent to his house as a lair. To provoke more activity and hopefully capture it on camera, we decided to throw large fireworks deep into the caves. We even utilized artillery shells and some slightly illegal old-style M80s. It appears our efforts have yielded the desired response. Tonight, my cousin ventured to inspect his livestock due to their restless behavior, and the creature was once again on the roof. In an attempt to deter it, he fired a shot, but the entity was incredibly swift. He described its speed as being akin to that of a jackrabbit. The creature possesses the size of a large dog, with glowing yellow eyes the size of golf balls. Its appearance is shrouded in darkness, and we are unable to discern if it is covered in fur or some other form of texture. Equally puzzling is its method of locomotion, whether it moves on two legs or all fours remains uncertain. Presently, it has retreated back into the depths of the caves, emitting an agitated, rapid clicking noise that reverberates with intensity. I am hopeful that the trail camera my cousin set up will capture some evidence of its existence. However, I must stress that investigating this entity carries a level of danger. It has exhibited hostile tendencies, 
making the situation potentially hazardous. Any guidance or assistance you can provide would be greatly appreciated. Dear Sir, I write you this story of my attack by a werewolf last August. It was a clear moonlit night as myself and a friend were sitting outside my home. I live near Oros, Sierra, Brazil near a large lake. I had heard strange sounds coming from the lake valley for many nights. It reminded me of a snorting bull but louder. There are legends of large demon dogs and stories of people who roam the night with wolf masks and steel sheep, but I never believed any of these tales. My friend, who lives near me in the valley, tends sheep and he had lost two in recent days. There was no blood found but there were large dog tracks in the mud by the lake's edge. We decided to wait out the night and search if we started to hear sounds again. The time was around 11 pm when we started to hear the grunts coming from below my property. It is a swampy area with a spring. We both carried shotguns hoping to find the varmint. We both thought it was probably a wild dog or maned wolf though we had never seen anything over the years we had lived here. As we walked closer to the swamp, something stood up over the weeds. It was hard to see but we both described it as a large wolf man and over 2 meters high. It stood like a man but had a wolf head and upper body. We were both shocked at this sight. I was able to fire a shot as it ran off but I was unsuccessful. But just a few minutes later we heard the grunts again as it become louder and closer. This creature charged on all fours out of the weeds towards me. It got very close but stopped and turned when my friend shot behind it. It was so close that he shot away so I would not be struck. It ran towards the valley. We tried to find this creature for weeks but never heard it again. Some of the local people think we witnessed a werewolf. I will never question the legends in the future. Do you have any idea what we saw? The local authorities refused to search for it though I feel it may have left the area. This occurred about one year ago, last summer. It was a weekday morning and I was still working from home, post-pandemic. I am a middle-aged woman and home alone. I live on a suburban street, with houses very spaced apart, think 60s as ranches, with half-acre lots. My backyard is fenced in, chain-link fence, with metal gate, I have a covered patio that is decorated and furnished. The patio has two short wood privacy fences on either side that block the neighbor's view, and the gate in the fence, I am sitting in my family room, on the couch, feet propped up, working on my laptop, facing the windows, that look out to the patio. All of a sudden, I see a person walk in front of the window. On the patio. I am thinking WTH, who's in my backyard. There is a wall between the windows and back door so I can't see the person anymore. I jump up and do the stupidest thing. I open, the back door, peek my head around and yell what the hell are you doing? I came face to face with this 20-something kid, wearing a reflective vest, holding what looks to me like a small metal detector. He says checking for gas. By now my dogs are behind me at the door. I replied we don't have gas. The man slash kid, just turned around and walked away. I noticed, he wore no name badge, no company logo, had no obvious phone or device for work etc. I immediately locked the door and ran to the front window. I see my catty corner neighbor out in her driveway. I step out and yell hey Ellen, was there a utility guy in your yard? Ellen yells you mean that guy and points right at the kid, as he is attempting to walk up another driveway. By now Ellen and I have met in the street, and I guess two women, pointing at him, scared him off because he stopped and just started walking away down the road. My street is a one-way in, one-way out kind of deal, not connected, to other neighborhoods. We saw no utility trucks, or contractor vehicles anywhere. No cars parked on the street. And my home really, does not have gas utilities, it is all electric. I went back inside because I had to attend an online work meeting. Later, my neighbor and I both called the gas company and were both told they had no one in the area. 
and knew nothing about checking gas lines. I did call the Sharif later that afternoon, they sent out a deputy, took a report. The deputy was pretty annoyed that we didn't report sooner. And that I opened the door and confronted the guy, as was my husband. I wasn't even scared in the moment, but I was freaked out the rest of the day. I put my 80 pound shepherd husky mix out back the rest of the day, wish she had have been outside when he walked up. I have seen something strange at night driving home and I can't for the life of me figure out what it was. Some people say it was a Newfoundland Bigfoot and I decided to look it up since I haven't heard of one here before. That led me to your site and the story of the boys from St. John's. I'd love to share my story. On my way home, in February 2017, we had a week of warm weather and my boyfriend and I were driving home on Big Triton Island on Highway 380. We came around a turn off one of the bridges next to a mussel farm and in the distance, I saw something so big that it scared me. It was far enough away that the headlights couldn't shine a light on it, but close enough that the rays of light highlighted it just enough for me to see its outline, and its eyes lit up like two big saucers. When it heard the car, it turned its head to look at us. That's when its eyes flared up and I saw just how tall it was. At first, I thought it was a big moose because of its size, and then I knew it wasn't when it ran off the road so fast the headlights didn't even touch it and I got to see just how huge the limbs were. Anyone who's anyone knows a moose has skinny little legs, but this one had huge muscular ones, similar to a bear's but also different because its paws were different, like large human hands. It was perhaps maybe a second or second and a half flat for it to get off the road and go completely out of sight. I slowed down as I neared where I had seen it and tried to look around the ditch which had a huge clearing before the tree line. There was a small cluster of about five trees in the middle where it was recently cleared and the animal was nowhere in sight. Normally I'm naturally curious and would stick around to try to see an animal, but I felt threatened and very much in danger. So I drove on. I know there are a lot of bears in the area but I have never seen one that big and I have seen and photographed many bears since they are so common. It took up most of the road and its reaction to seeing the car and ever so stealthy retreating off the road was so creepy because you could see it was intelligent, not fearful of the car. It didn't want to be hit by the lights so it can remain in the shadows. It simply didn't want one to be seen. It struck me as so smart, so big so unlike anything I have seen on the island. I thought perhaps it was a bear up early because of the warm weather. But it was the biggest mofo I have ever seen, and it's winter. I mistook it for a freaking full-grown moose. I don't know what I saw, but it's the first time I've ever seen anything like that and it was by far the biggest thing I have seen on the island. I was really frightened and normally I'm excited to see wildlife. My boyfriend didn't see it, but he's night blind, and I have to keep an eye out for moose when he drives and let him know if I see them because my night sight is really good. My name is Joe Crop, and I find myself entangled in a peculiar situation involving a cryptid that I am desperate to learn more about. But more importantly, I need to connect with anyone willing to explore its lair. Allow me to share the second-hand information that has led me to this point. I hesitate to label my cousin as a liar because he is an honest and trustworthy individual. However, strange occurrences have plagued his property far too frequently. Synced car alarms blaring simultaneously, animals mysteriously vanishing without a trace, and pole lights flickering on and off randomly, despite receiving a clean bill of health from the electric company, these are just a few examples. More recently, something has taken to walking on his roof. Multiple witnesses have attested to hearing the eerie footsteps. However, whenever someone investigates, the presence vanishes without a trace. It dawned on me that it might be utilizing the caves and the sinkhole adjacent to his house as a lair. To provoke more activity and hopefully capture it on camera, we decided to throw large fireworks deep into the caves. We even utilized artillery shells and some slightly illegal old-style M80s. It appears our efforts have yielded the desired response. Tonight, 
My cousin ventured to inspect his livestock due to their restless behavior, and the creature was once again on the roof. In an attempt to deter it, he fired a shot, but the entity was incredibly swift. He described its speed as being akin to that of a jackrabbit. The creature possesses the size of a large dog, with glowing yellow eyes the size of golf balls. Its appearance is shrouded in darkness, and we are unable to discern if it is covered in fur or some other form of texture. Equally puzzling is its method of locomotion, whether it moves on two legs or all fours remains uncertain. Presently, it has retreated back into the depths of the caves, emitting an agitated, rapid clicking noise that reverberates with intensity. I am hopeful that the trail camera my cousin set up will capture some evidence of its existence. However, I must stress that investigating this entity carries a level of danger. It has exhibited hostile tendencies, making the situation potentially hazardous. Any guidance or assistance you can provide would be greatly appreciated. My boyfriend and I frequently go camping together. The summer of 2016 was when this encounter took place. We had set up camp in a little site along a trucking road. It was about 40 minutes outside of a smaller town in the area, and only had two campsites in this location. We chose the first site, which had a bit of a dirt hill to drive down, but the actual site was shaped into a circle. The other site was within view, but far enough away, and surrounded by enough trees that you couldn't really see people in it, only tents and our versus we noticed that the other site had an RV in it, but it's a relatively common spot and it was a weekend so this was common. When the sun went down we were sitting around the fire, probably around 11 pm when we hear some AT versus in the distance. This is a little weird because typically people ride them during the day, but not really concerning. However, then we see the headlights get closer and closer. Two AT versus drive into our site, and at this point we're a little creeped out because it's pitch black, we're all alone, and in a no service area. Two men get off the AT versus and walk towards us. I should mention that my boyfriend and I were 19 and 20 at the time, and these men are big. They come up and try holding just casual conversation talking about how they're at the site beside us and wanted to introduce themselves. This is still a little concerning, as who introduces themselves this late at night. They continue to talk to us for probably 20 minutes before my boyfriend starts saying how we're running out of firewood and probably going to head to bed soon in an effort to get them to leave. They then start talking about how they'll bring their own firewood over and bring us some drinks. We try saying we're really tired but they insist and leave the site. So my boyfriend and I quickly start trying to pack up the site and make it seem as though we really did go to bed. We did hear the AT versus later on that night passing by our site, but we didn't get out of our tent to check. Overall, it seems really mild, but it really freaked us out just being alone in the woods with these two bigger men. The whole situation was just really off. This incident occurred in Ozona, Texas in the summer of 2015. I had been on the phone with my ex-boyfriend, but I had fallen asleep. Then I suddenly woke up because I could hear my ex-boyfriend saying baby please, don't do this. I believe that I had broken up with him while I was sleep talking to him. Anyway, he was telling me I was saying ugly things to him. In the middle of our conversation, I hear wings flapping and see a large shadow stop at my window. The first thing that runs through my mind is La Lechusa. I tell my ex not to hang up, but not to say anything. I'm scared. And I don't explain anything to him. Then all of a sudden the shadow disappears. I then start telling my ex what happened, when from the ceiling of my room I hear this horrible laugh and scratching. Then I try to yell and nothing comes out. I am frozen scared. I try to yell, I try to get up, but I can't. Somehow I finally jump off my bed and run across to where my cousin and her daughters are asleep. I try to wake up my cousin so I touch her and she opens her eyes. I said, there's a lechusa. But she didn't understand me. She said what? Pretty loud. 
The girls woke up and right then it's right above my cousin's room. The girls start to cry. I'm starting to freak the heck out. We don't know what to do. My cousin and I decide to call the cops and tell them that we saw someone looking in the window. I mean what would they think if we said, we need an officer to rid us of this lechusa? Anyway, we call them and I swear the scratching, laughing and thuds are loud and getting louder. We wait and literally seconds before we see the spotlight from the cops outside, it stops. The cop arrives, but they soon leave. About 10 minutes after he leaves it comes back. We run to the car and decide to leave. That was the last day I lived with my cousin. I reside in Southern Appalachia, nestled next to the scenic Pisgah and DuPont forests. In this picturesque region, I have become acquainted with a rather intriguing phenomenon. It's not something I can easily explain, but I often catch glimpses of shadow-like beings with dark faces. They stand about five and a half to six feet tall, peering around from behind trees. These sightings have become a regular occurrence in my life. At first, I attributed these encounters to the paranormal, as I can never seem to find them once they retreat behind the protective veil of foliage. Every day, without fail, I spot at least three of these enigmatic figures. It's frustrating that I have never managed to capture a photograph in time, as they swiftly vanish from view. It's as if they possess a supernatural ability to conceal themselves. Curiously, after briefly revealing themselves to me, they occasionally peek back out from behind the tree to check if I have moved on. Despite their elusive nature, I have never felt threatened by their presence. We seem to coexist in a state of peaceful indifference. I go about my daily activities, paying them no mind and they reciprocate by showing no signs of aggression or harm. I share this story in the hopes that someone may shed light on the nature of these mysterious beings. Perhaps there are others who have encountered similar phenomena or possess knowledge that can help unravel this enigma. If not, that's perfectly alright. Maybe someone will find amusement or intrigue in my account. After all, it's the peculiar mysteries that add flavor to our lives and spark the imagination. I lived in a forested part of a coal mining town where my grandfather built a log cabin. As a teenager, I didn't sleep much for whatever reason. Because of that, I would go for walks at night. Nothing too strange ever happened except an occasional whistling noise that I would only hear during my walks, not when I'm sitting on the deck or wandering the yard. I'm not sure if this is even related to the following event. One night, I was talking with my grandfather in his office about that unfamiliar sound, he usually always had an answer, but not this time. We joked around about its possible origins and then I said goodnight. My phone had been dead for a few hours at this point, but midway down the steps, it turned on and started playing Walking After Midnight by Patsy Cline but only the I'm always walking, after midnight, searching for you part before shutting off again. My phone has been dead for at least two hours at this point and that was not the last song I was listening to. I tried turning it back on to see if maybe I was mistaken that it died, but it flashed the dead battery symbol for a moment before going black again. Then my grandfather, whose office is only a few feet from the steps, calls out another fun fact. Patsy Cline died in a plane crash on my birthday. Obviously, I didn't go for a walk that night, or at all until I got a dog. If this story is interesting at all, I have more that may or may not be connected to this event. It was in the early hours of the morning on a particular day in the early 2000s when a middle-aged woman was found unconscious on the road in a Daiwanya, Kuwait suburb. When she was taken to the hospital, she had a horrific story to tell the authorities. Apparently, she was a musician, and she had been hired to provide entertainment for a gathering in a large villa in the neighborhood she was found in. As the night went on, however, she came to realize that a number of her clients weren't entirely human. She tried to escape and evidently failed. This happened in Daiwanya, Kuwait in Western Asia. 
In the early 2000s, stories appeared in the Kuwaiti media detailing the run-in that a hapless victim had with beings that would normally be confined to the dark reaches of mythology and folklore. The musician was a middle-aged woman who plays a traditional Kuwaiti instrument. She received a call from a prospective client who wanted to hire her for her services during the month of Ramadan. Since it is inappropriate to perform music during Ramadan, the witness initially refused. But the caller insisted and tripled her usual fee, eventually persuading her to go. The caller sent their own driver to pick her up, and what began as a usual musical event suddenly took a sharp turn for the supernatural. The party started early in the evening but continued on until 12 am, at which point some of the attendees began to act bizarrely. A group of young girls at the center of the room, for example, started to dance very aggressively. They moved in such a vigorous manner that their legs began showing under their long dresses, revealing that their legs were not, in fact, those of humans, but rather bore a closer resemblance to horses' legs. Terrified, the woman ran out of the party where she found the driver who had picked her up waiting for her. She quickly got into the car and refused to comment when the driver asked her what was wrong due to being too distraught to speak coherently. After a couple of minutes, however, she had calmed down enough to be asked again by the driver. She told him that some of the party goers did not have human legs, prompting the driver to reply you mean just like mine? Before revealing his legs under his clothes. Like the young girls at the gathering, they were those of an animal. The woman was hysterical with fear at this point, and so threw herself from the car and landed on the street, rendering herself unconscious. The next day, after reporting the bizarre incident, she decided to return to the villa accompanied by the local authorities. However, the villa was gone. It had completely vanished, leaving nothing behind but an empty yard. Last week me and my significant other went on a hike at night time. It had to be around 12 am. We went on this wooded path. And though it was eerie we figured we would be fine as we had each other. We barely saw anyone until we start going up this path and see an individual further ahead of us with a flashlight on, they turned it on then off a couple of times. We continued walking up the hill the person in front of us. Eventually at some point they went off path and we no longer saw them. We continued up to the spot we were headed and stopped there sat and talked and made out for about an hour. Then as we are making our way back to the secluded area's exit. We hear rustling in the bushes near us. We both looked over expecting to see an animal. Until we realized the rustling was too loud and the shape in the bushes was too big. It was a person. They rose their head up a bit and we caught a glimpse of the flashlight as they started to emerge out of the bush. I quickly realized whatever was happening was very off. Out of fear I screamed and took off running. My significant other followed a bit behind. I at first heard more than just her footsteps than just hers. Meaning he attempted to follow or chase us potentially for a few seconds. We got away. I'm not sure when he got in the bush. If he was there before us, but that means he was sitting there for over an hour in silence by himself. I don't know what exactly that was or what he was doing. But I would hate to have found out what happened if we didn't run. When in Albuquerque we stayed at the Air Force Base in what used to be base housing. They rented out for travelers. Better than a hotel. Full house, kitchen, washer, etc. Anyway, when we got to the house, the back door to the yard was open. No big deal, I thought they just left it open. That night while trying to sleep, I kept a small light on in the kitchen and I remember seeing the light dim like it was being blocked momentarily. I was half asleep so I figured the dog was blocking it as he walked by. Then sometime in the early hours, I thought I heard young girls talking and giggling. Didn't think much of it. Thought maybe dreaming or outside. Then a little later I hear my dog barking outside. I'm thinking WTF? Can't be my dog. No way out. So I called him and he didn't come to the room so I got up. 
He was outside the backyard with the back door open. I'm a freak about locking the doors. My son even asked me if I locked up before bed. The lock has the knob lock as well as bolt lock. Now, I'm not saying I experienced something paranormal, but I can't explain it logically. And when I got to thinking, the dog could not have blocked the light. He isn't tall enough. And no human could be in the house without my dog attacking it, or even outside the house with him at the very least barking. Kinda interesting. My friend and I went to a holiday party about a year back, and we had an early morning meeting for a volunteer event the following day. It was around 12 1 am when we decided to leave the party, but my friend realized that she forgot to buy drinks for the meeting in the morning. Not wanting her to have to wake up earlier than she had to, I offered to drive her to a nearby grocery store that happened to be open late. On the way there, we realized that it was super quiet and there weren't any other cars around, which is pretty typical if it would have been a weekday. But it was a Saturday, and usually, Saturdays are busy until 3 am in our city. Nonetheless, we drove on and reached the store. As we drove in, we saw a lady literally appear seemingly out of nowhere, dancing around in a very free-looking way. I don't really know how to describe her outfit other than almost pirate-like. There were pieces of cloth hanging off of her outfit, her face was pale white with dark, but neat, eye makeup, and her hair looked like it might have been really big dreadlocks with more cloth, or maybe even feathers, tied into it. We quickly pulled into a far parking spot, well away from her, and practically sprinted into the store, and when we looked back, she was gone. Not sure if this matters, but I figured I would include the ambience of the store as well in case this is a cross-dimensional experience. The lights were dim with some flickering, and when we first walked in, there was a couple, about middle-aged and I think the woman was pregnant if I remember correctly, whispering too, seemingly, the only employee. When they spotted us, they stopped talking and watched us walk down the juice aisle. Needless to say, my friend said she changed her mind and wanted to leave. When we first stepped out, we both happened to look to our left and saw the woman from earlier, standing still at the opposite end of the parking lot. We immediately booked it to my car, got in, and locked the doors. But, when I tried to start it, it wouldn't, I had just bought the car a couple of weeks prior from a certified dealership, and the car never had, and still never has to this day, given me issues. Luckily, after a few turns of the key, my car started and we left. In my rear view mirror, the entity? Danced towards my car again, but it was almost as though she was sprinting because she was moving so quickly toward us. Once we made it back over the hill towards our homes, it was as though every single car that should have been on the other side of the hill appeared and the town was as busy as usual. I still have no idea who slash what we saw, but I know very well that there was no way that what we experienced was natural in this world. If anyone has opinions on what creature or entity we saw that night, please share. As much as I'm still scared of that incident, I am anxious to know what we experienced. I forgot to mention that this happened in Southern California in a city near Los Angeles. Later, I was at a pet store nearby where I saw the dancing woman, and I saw her in the parking lot again. This time it was daylight. I should have taken a photo, but I didn't feel right about it. The woman looked normal, or at least as normal as a woman dressed as a pirate could look. As fun or scary as the story from that night a couple of years ago is, I think that the woman I saw was just that, a woman, who seemed out of place due to her attire, movements, and behavior. The story is still weird and gives me chills, especially since the people inside the grocery store were acting so strange, but I think it's safe to say, that she was not an entity after all. I can't really explain it, I just knew it wasn't a person. The way the body of it moved was very strange. It wasn't just dancing. It was twisting and, I don't want to say floating but I think that would be the best way to describe it, it just wasn't a natural way of moving. My friend and I have been trying to piece the information together because we can only describe what we as individuals experienced. I've dealt with a handful of strange people, 
especially when getting closer to LA, but this was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I just felt so much dread like I never had before. Maybe this isn't the right sub to post this experience in, but I haven't the slightest clue what to even categorize this experience as. So I grew up in a small town in Canada, just up from my house in the hillside there was a shack. This shack was a bit bigger than an outhouse had a bed and a desk in it. Every full moon at about 2 am you could see this figure standing overlooking my neighborhood followed by a dark ominous laugher and cries if this thing has been hurt deeply. What's strange is only the kids in the neighborhood could see it. It doesn't stop there though, we were all sitting in the hot tub at my neighbor's house and the house next to his was just getting built, so there was no fence between his house and the new house. We were all talking when my buddy saw something in the basement window, he was facing the house. We all turn and at the same time we see an old man in the window and his smile grew to a huge size. We all saw it. Since then nothing has happened because we all moved and went separate ways, but now the hillside has been fully developed into housing. Do you think this was an evil entity or some soul suffering? This happened around 1994 in Massachusetts. He was tall and skinny with a cowboy hat. A dark silhouette with the hallway lit behind him leaning against the doorframe watching me from the hallway looking into my bedroom. Made my breath go away and then I was paralyzed for a long time. When I could finally move I searched my whole house for signs of an intruder and found none. I was in 7th or 8th grade. I grew up getting sleep paralysis almost nightly until midway through high school. Any time I would fall asleep while laying on my back I'd slip into sleep paralysis. I would always feel it coming but I couldn't escape the pull. If that makes any sense. This was the only time I saw the man with the hat. I consider it the only time I've seen a ghost to this day. The sleep paralysis before and after that always involved shadowy figures moving around my bed that I could only sense in my peripheral. I remember being a little kid finding myself locked in fear on my back while sleeping or in bed with these shadows. I felt I could never let them know I was aware of them or they'd get me. I stopped getting sleep paralysis after one experience where I was feeling myself being pulled down into it. This is the only way to describe the feeling of transitioning from being awake to being in sleep paralysis. Like hands are pulling you downwards and your spirit is not strong enough to pull free. I remember frantically wanting to not be pulled down and somehow I pulled myself up and out of the hands. Since then I haven't had sleep paralysis. I remember it feeling like a balloon inside popped and I suddenly knew I'd never get pulled down again and I haven't since. Sometimes I wonder if it was me. Or if the three places I lived growing up happened to be haunted. Either way, I'll never forget the fear I felt upon waking and seeing the man with the hat in the doorway. I had always slept with my door open until that happened. In my 20s in the Midwest suburbs, I was introduced to a playground called the Haunted Playground that I didn't believe was haunted. After visiting at night with my friends, and all of us having little creepy encounters, we started to hang out there semi-occasionally over a span of like two years. We even tried to bring other friends in there, and not tell them anything about the park to see if they also noticed the weirdness. A bunch of little weird things happened that I won't put here, like one time we brought a friend and they refused to get out of the car suddenly and freaked out, but three things stand out. We brought a friend that also didn't know the place was haunted and they were like, I keep seeing this thing pop up behind me, but it's just the park. And we are like, no way dude, this place is the haunted playground. And the three of us start whisper arguing about it being haunted. Suddenly, right in the middle of our semi-circle argument, this bright triangle-shaped streak of light, shoots down to the ground. It was like a weird moment that slowed down with all of us watching this silver light. The best way to describe it was like a slow motion sword reflection off the moonlight, piercing the ground, ha ha ha. Another time, with another group of friends we heard someone stomping in the leaves, and it sounded like a human running towards us, 
And then this deer just walks out from behind a tree, all quiet and light-footed in the grass. A few minutes later, one of the friends suddenly starts to usher us out of the playground in a friendly, but semi-urgent way. Like, putting hands on all of us and leading us out of the park. In my head I was thinking that deer spooked him something good? So I kind of lagged behind a bit, just looking around to see anything. On the way out of the park you have to pass the park district clubhouse, and I see someone on the roof of clubhouse. And I strain my eyes for a moment because for a second, I'm like, oh what's that guy doing on the roof, almost like it could be normal for a second. But I notice the guy is all in the shadow, you can't see any details, just a head, torso, and this arm holding onto the chimney. Holding himself up and crouching down behind the chimney, as if he doesn't want to be noticed, but also wrapped around the chimney as if he was veering around it to get a better look at us. And, I think he has horns. We all get back into the car and I was like, hey did you make us leave about the deer? And he doesn't want to say anything until we are way out of the neighborhood. But apparently, right after the deer he noticed the guy with horns on the roof of the clubhouse, could not rationalize what he was seeing, and just noped us all out of there as fast as he could. And then he was freaked out that I also saw the dude, and even noticed the horns. After the dude with horns on the roof guy, we cut back on the visits and also discovered that you didn't need to actually go into the park to see any weird paranormal action. A girlfriend of mine went with me once after that, and we were both too chicken to get out of the car, so we parked facing the haunted playground, but over two blocks. We were smoking cigarettes and chit-chatting with the car off, lights off, in the dark. The only street lights on, were in the block ahead of us and on the sidewalk. The haunted playground is to the right. The conversation stops, and I'm just watching the street and I see something coming from the direction of the haunted playground. It's just a clear outline of a person walking. It was clearly a person walking, but you could see right through to them. It was just like a weird glowy outline of a person. But no person. So I whisper to my friend, because I am like freaking out about seeing a literal invisible person? Me whispering, I'm whispering right now, because there is something out there freaking me out, and I don't want it to hear us. Do you see it? Friend, oh thank god you see it too. Me, tell me what you see so I know I'm not crazy. Friend, the person walking that's not there? Me, yeah, what in the ever living f is that? Friend, are we seeing a willow the wisp right now? Me, what is a willow wisp? Friend, a bad thing. We just watched it walk off to the left, deeper into the subdivision. We waited about 5 minutes and then slowly and as quiet as possible turned on the car and left. But to this day I have no idea about the guy with horns, and the invisible person no person was or what they were. I don't know why this playground and the subdivision it is on is weird land, but, the playground is connected to a forest that connects to a much larger forest with some spots cut through by highways or other subdivisions. Growing up all the weird stories came from the forest area behind the haunted playground area. Cut up deer parts arranged in a ritual sacrifice, that forest. Someone stole a cow from a couple towns over and mutilated it and guess where they found the head? That same forest. Thanks for reading. I'm a trucker by the name of Jack. I've driven through many a desolate stretch of road, passing by endless miles of nothingness. The solitude doesn't bother me. In fact, I kind of like it. But there's this one memory, this one particular drive through the middle of nowhere Colorado that still sends a chill down my spine. There wasn't much around. Just barren landscapes, the open road stretching out in front of me, and my truck humming along to the rhythm of the highway. It was the only road visible on my map, and it was almost eerily devoid of human touch. But then, up ahead in the horizon, probably about a half mile away from the road, I spotted an unusual cluster of houses or buildings. In a place so desolate, so untouched by civilization, the sight of these structures seemed utterly out of place. Intrigued, I kept my eyes on them as I approached, curiosity piqued by the incongruity of it all. 
As I drove past, I got a clearer view. The houses were set up in a circle, forming a sort of perimeter around an open area. What was more unsettling, though, were the people I saw walking around in the center. They were all donned in black robes, their faces hidden from view, gathering in a tight circle. Then, out of nowhere, three black SU versus appeared. They drove across the barren landscape, plumes of dust rising in their wake, heading directly towards the group. A sense of unease crept over me, a cold shiver snaking down my spine as I watched the scene unfold. Something about it felt wrong, like I was inadvertently witnessing something I shouldn't. I remember wishing I had the time to stick around, to see what was really going on. But duty called. I had a schedule to keep, deliveries to make. So, I kept driving, leaving the strange sight behind me. In the rearview mirror, the sight of the robed figures and black SU versus slowly faded into the vast Colorado landscape. I often find myself mulling over that sight, wondering what was happening back there. It seemed like something out of a cult movie, a secret meeting in the middle of nowhere. But I guess, I'll never know for sure. All I have is this unsettling memory and a story that sounds too strange to be true. I've seen many odd things during my years on the road, but that eerie sight in Colorado remains the most inexplicable of them all. There's something about driving at night that strips the world of its normalcy, turns the mundane into the mysterious. I learned this the hard way during a run from Yuma, Arizona, driving the lonely stretch where the I-8 intersects the 85 at Gila Bend. It was a familiar route for me. I'd made countless runs along that road, so much so that I even had a regular spot where I'd pull over to stretch my legs and take a leak. That night was no different, or at least that's what I thought as I rounded a bend, the spot in question just up ahead. As I was about to pull over, my headlights illuminated a figure strolling across the highway. It was a creature unlike anything I'd seen before, a strange amalgamation of features that didn't belong together. It looked canine but its appearance was grotesquely warped. Its hind legs were elongated, almost rabbit-like, but twisted in a way that didn't seem natural. Its body was lean and muscular, its defined muscles rippling under the skin as it moved. Its snout was long and narrow, like that of a wolf, but devoid of any fur. The creature's skin was an unusual sight, a stark contrast to the mangy patches you'd expect on a hairless animal. Instead, it was thick and tough-looking, almost akin to a rhino's, but it had an uncanny smoothness to it that caught the reflection of my headlights. But what really got me, what truly sent a shiver down my spine, was the way it regarded me. As I slowed down, it didn't panic or run away as you'd expect a wild animal to. It simply continued its leisurely stroll, its eyes never leaving me. It was as if it was sizing me up, unafraid and eerily calm. The creature was massive, easily the size of a Great Dane or a Cane Corso, and its bizarre, uncanny appearance left an indelible mark on my memory. I watched, paralyzed, as it disappeared into the darkness on the other side of the road. Needless to say, I didn't stop that night, nor any other night after that. My usual pit stop was permanently tainted by that eerie encounter. Now, Every time I make that run, I can't help but scan the roadside, half expecting to see that creature again. And each time, a chill runs down my spine, a reminder of the night when the mundane turned into the mysterious. I've always had a knack for getting myself into unusual situations. But when I was transferred to a remote town in Alaska, I had no idea just how unusual things would get. The town was surrounded by a vast, dense forest infamous for its strange occurrences. The locals spoke in hushed whispers about the inexplicable disappearances of hikers and chilling apparitions that had a knack for driving people mad. The rumors didn't bother me until the day a couple vanished without a trace during a routine hike. I was Officer Jane Wilkinson and leading my team of 10 officers into the depths of that forest was a decision that would forever haunt me. 
We were seasoned police officers. As we moved deeper into the forest, we encountered inexplicable phenomena. Disembodied whispers filled the air, seeming to lure us further into the wilderness. Apparitions flickered in and out of sight among the trees, their presence chilling us to the bone. Then, one by one, my team started to disappear. No cries for help, no gunshots, just a terrifying silence that stretched on until we were down to half our original number. That's when we saw it, a monstrous creature, more beast than man, its twisted form a grotesque mockery of a dog. The cryptid the locals feared was real, and it was hunting us. With my heart pounding in my chest and the primal fear of being hunted surging through me, I found myself stumbling upon its lair. A ghastly sight awaited me there, the remains of countless hikers scattered around the clearing. Gritting my teeth, I radioed the station, relaying the grim discoveries and the horrifying situation. The backup was hours away, the terrain too treacherous for a quick response. Alone and scared, I decided to search for the cryptid. I crept through the woods, my flashlight revealing nothing but shadows and the occasional pair of reflective eyes belonging to a harmless critter. Hours passed in a chilling silence, the creature nowhere to be found. Every snap of a twig, every rustle of leaves set my heart racing. The sky was beginning to lighten when I realized my search had been futile. The cryptid was gone, and I was left alone with my fear and the haunting memories of my fallen comrades. As I write this report, I can't help but replay the horrific events of that day in my mind. The fear, the despair, and the overwhelming sense of loss. But if there's one thing I've learned, it's that even in the face of insurmountable odds, you don't back down. You fight. You survive. And you live to tell the tale. I'm not the type to believe in the supernatural, the occult, or even cryptids for that matter. But there's this one experience, an eerie encounter on the eve of Halloween that shook me to my core. I was young and invincible then, or so I believed, cruising down the rural roads of Illinois in my sleek sports car. It was a pitch black night, the kind that makes you feel like you're the only person left in the world, and I was relishing the solitude. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a black cat darted across the road. Its eyes, reflecting in my headlights, gave me just enough time to swerve, narrowly avoiding hitting it. The car spun out of control, the tires screeching against the asphalt, and came to a stop with the headlights facing a nearby field. And that's when I saw them. Dozens of people, all donned in black robes, standing amidst the tall grass. Their eyes, wide with surprise, reflected in my high beams. The sight was so surreal, so out of place, it took me a moment to fully comprehend what I was seeing. Before I could react, they scattered. Like shadows fleeing from the light, they dissolved into the darkness. But a few, their faces hidden beneath their robes, started charging towards my car. Fear gripped me, adrenaline surging through my veins. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears, and without thinking, I slammed on the accelerator, peeling out of there as fast as I could. The sight of the robed figures, their forms shrinking in my rearview mirror, is something I'll never forget. Now, this was back in the late 90s, before the Harry Potter frenzy took over. So, it's safe to say it wasn't some fan gathering. I don't know what they were doing out there in the middle of nowhere, in the dead of night, but it felt like I had stumbled upon something I wasn't supposed to see. Now to the part that still gives me chills to this day. In the split second before I hit the gas, I saw something else in that field. At the edge of my high beams, there was a figure, far taller than any of the robed people, hunched over, and covered in hair. It stood on two legs and its eyes, glowing in the darkness, met mine. I've heard tales of cryptids, stories told to scare kids or thrill seekers, but in that moment, I couldn't deny what I was seeing. It was something unknown, something out of place in the world as I knew it. I didn't stick around to find out what it was. I just drove, leaving the field, the robed people, and the cryptid far behind.
Since I can remember, I've always had a deep love for nature, you could say it's my passion. That's why a job as a park ranger felt like a perfect fit. I remember one particular job at a nature park that operated from 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. Our shifts were always rotating. One week I'd be on the early shift and the next, I'd be closing up for the night. One Friday evening, I found myself on the closing shift. I had led a brief tour for some visitors that day, but other than that, my day was relatively quiet. Since there wasn't much to do, I decided to start my evening walkthrough early. It was already getting dark, and I was making my way through the woods when I noticed a strange light flashing against the trees behind me. Curious, I went to check out the source of the light. But as I got closer, the light flashed again, this time from the direction I had just come from. I yelled out, telling whoever was messing with me to stop it. Then, the light flashed again from a completely different direction, too far for a single person to have moved in such a short time. I figured it must have been two people messing with me, maybe some co-workers, although we weren't particularly close and we didn't typically play such pranks. I yelled again, stating I wasn't in the mood for jokes and that whoever was responsible should leave. Realizing I had no control over this situation, I informed my supervisor that someone might still be in the park and that it wasn't my problem anymore. He told me he'd take over, so I left, got in my car, and began the 10 minute drive home. Suddenly, my phone rang. It was an unknown number. I answered it, and a raspy voice on the other end told me I shouldn't have left them there alone, that I would regret it. I warned them never to call me again and hung up. When I returned to work the next day, I was informed that they'd found a dead dog at the spot where I had seen the flashing lights. The realization hit me like a cold wave, this was the work of a seriously disturbed individual, someone who would commit such a horrific act just to mess with me. This wasn't while hiking, but once a friend and I were driving on an old dirt road way out in the sticks in South Alabama, past an old, 19th century, cemetery, when out of nowhere a truck starts tailgating us. This was really late at night and even in the daytime it would have been rare to see a vehicle, so we were a little creeped out. I speed up and the truck stays right on my bumper. I'm now driving as fast as I can without flying off the road on this small, windy dirt road, think Dukes of Hazard only in a Volvo station wagon, and still can't shake the truck. My buddy who was with me knew the area well and said that we were about to hit a paved road T-bone intersection, and that there was also another small dirt road coming off at a sharp angle from that intersection. He said that if I could get ahead just enough to get out of immediate sight of the truck, then I could cut the wheel hard to the left and whip into the spur road and hopefully ditch the truck. I did what he said but right when I start the turn at the T-bone I see what looks like an incredibly tall person just inside the tree line across the paved road, covered head to toe in long hair. As I'm turning I shout holy shit. Do you see? And before I can finish my friend says. That big tall hairy guy. I finish the turn, we ditch the truck, and got the hell out of there, but to this day we really don't know what we saw. driving through Idaho once in the dead of night and there was this biker who'd been following for the last 50 miles. When you drive sometimes it's just you and someone else for long stretches. I call them road buddies. He was my road buddy. I don't know when it happened but I checked my mirror and he wasn't there anymore. There wasn't really anywhere to turn off, but maybe he pulled over for one reason or another. I look back up and there is a biker in front of me. I don't know if it's the same guy or not. Again, there's not really anywhere to pull over, it's just a bunch of flat dry land with simple fencing on either side. I follow the guy for a mile or so and all of a sudden he pitches hard right like he just took a pothole the worst way possible. I saw him tumble and watched his bike kick up a huge cloud of dust. We're not supposed to pull over or pick up hitchhikers but in this kind of situation I don't care what the company says. I pulled right over and got out, left the keys in it and everything. 
I walked back must have been a quarter mile or more and couldn't find hide nor hair of him or his bike. There were no marks from where he pulled off, and no potholes either. I walked around calling out to him the dark for what felt like half an hour before walking back to my truck. When I climbed in there he was sitting in my passenger seat. He was covered in blood, twigs, and dirt. His leg had been snapped off at the knee and he had taken off his belt to make a tourniquet. He his middle through pinky fingers were pushed back and standing straight up. I asked him if he was okay, but he didn't say anything, he just sat there silent. I tried to touch his shoulder to see if he was even awake and his jaw fell open and he let loose a hideous scream that still chills me to this day. His head fell forward and he started vomiting blood. I screamed and fell backward out of my truck. I woke up apparently a few hours later with a state trooper asking me if I was okay. He was pretty smug about the whole thing and acted like I was making it up. I guess they found a teener of meth on the passenger seat and said it belonged to me. I tried telling them about the ghost rider but nobody would listen. My dad and I have always loved the great outdoors, the thrill of hiking, the serenity of nature, the chance to bond and the allure of camping under the stars. So, we'd planned a weekend trip to the mountains to get our nature fix. We'd found an ideal spot, away from the beaten path, and had just set up our tents for the night when an eerie sound cut through the tranquil silence, screams echoing from deeper within the woods. Now, as a pair of sensible black folks, we weren't about to stick around and investigate the source of those screams. Mountains folks eating people? Nope, not a scenario we were interested in starring in. We quickly packed up our stuff, doused the fire, and without another word, hopped into our car to find a different camping spot. As we moved further away from the spine-chilling sounds, we decided to make a pit stop at a convenience store at the foot of the mountains. The clerk was a local, a friendly old chap who'd probably seen more sunsets than there were pebbles on the mountains. We casually mentioned the screams we'd heard, expecting him to be as alarmed as we were. But his reaction was quite the opposite. He laughed, a hearty laugh that seemed to shake his entire frame. When he finally calmed down, he wiped a tear from his eye and told us what was really going on. Turns out, those weren't screams of horror we'd heard but sounds of pleasure, the local tradition was something we had not anticipated, a yearly outdoor orgy for people who dressed up in animal costumes. A furry gathering, if you will. This eccentric group had been congregating in the mountains for years, as per the clerk, and we had unwittingly set camp right in the heart of their rendezvous spot. We drove away, laughter replacing the fear in our hearts. Our fatherson camping trip had taken a strange turn, certainly, but it was one for the books. An unusual story to tell around future campfires, a peculiar local tradition that we'll always associate with our love for camping. Needless to say, we made a mental note to do better research about local traditions before choosing our next camping spot. My friend and I used to go ghost hunting when we were in middle school. It consisted of me asking questions directed towards spirits and ghosts. This is pre-smartphone days. We also brought a handheld voice recorder that was pretty expensive. It was his dad's who was into music and playing instruments. We brought the recorder because we knew it was more likely we would get an EVP than an interaction we were aware of. EVP, electronic voice phenomenon, is when you record a noise or voice of a spirit slash paranormal entity on your device. When you play the recording you hear the EVP which you did not hear with your own ears because the frequency was too high. I have had several interactions but I'll talk about two right now. The first I actually heard and it was terrifying. It was an especially creepy night at the location we were at which we frequented for these interactions. So creepy as took us 15 to 20 minutes to walk 20 feet. Other nights we would freely walk around and not be creeped out because we didn't feel like there was another presence. Well this night there was something there, and after I asked a question something in front of me, 
About 10 feet away swiftly glided towards me while gargling a low og which got progressively louder and more aggressive as it came towards me. The noise came all the way right up to me before I could start to run away. It moved really fast but I could see absolutely nothing in front of me. There was no body there. My friend and I bolted and ran all the way home. We listened to the record of the next morning since we were too afraid to play it that night. And it was exactly like I describe it now. The other experience. This was an EVP. We were listening to a recording at his house that we had just recorded. On the recording I was casually talking to him about something when all of a sudden there is a blood-curdling female scream. On the recorder it was way louder than my voice and long and drawn out as if a woman had just been stabbed or seen some horrific shit. It was the most chilling scream I have ever heard and I did not hear it at all when I was at that creepy location having the conversation with my friend. On the recording device when the scream happens I am mid-sentence and I do not pause or react. Neither of us do. I remember that night and we heard no scream. I've had some other experiences that are just as scary, seen an actual apparition, seen poltergeist, had my girlfriend physically hit and pushed on more than one occasion and I've had some other EVPs. Sometimes, life takes you down a path you never intended to tread. That's exactly what happened to me and my mate, all those years ago while bushwalking in New South Wales, Australia. We were just two friends on an adventure, with no idea of the sinister discovery we were about to stumble upon. In the heart of the bush, Amidst the eucalyptus and the bird calls, we found a peculiar structure. It was a platform, made entirely out of rocks, carefully arranged in a way that suggested it was intentional, not just a natural formation. It seemed out of place in the wilderness, a discordant note in an otherwise harmonious symphony. We didn't think much of it at the time, simply marking it up as a curious discovery before we continued on our journey. It was only much later that year that the memory of the rock platform took on a dark, foreboding significance. It began with a string of news reports about a series of arrests. Backpackers had been disappearing in the area over a span of few years, their disappearances largely chalked up to the risks of traveling in such isolated locales. That is until a man was arrested on suspicion of their murders. As the case unfolded, it was like a veil being lifted from our eyes. The news ran footage of so-called altars discovered at several of the murder sites, slightly hidden in the dense bushland. The chilling sight of those altars, constructed from rocks, sent a shiver down my spine. They were eerily similar to the platform we had encountered on our bushwalk. Worse yet, they were often found no more than 300 yards from the victim's shallow graves. The man at the center of this horrifying tale was Ivan Milat, now known as Australia's worst serial killer. He was convicted for the murders and has since spent his life behind bars. Yet, the thought that we had unknowingly stumbled upon one of his macabre altars was a chilling realization that has never quite left us. Even more unsettling is the fact that the police suspect that Milat didn't act alone. Although they were unable to gather enough evidence to prove it, the belief that there was at least one other person involved in the heinous crimes persists. The idea that this accomplice might still be out there, possibly continuing Malat's horrific legacy, added another layer of unease to our fateful encounter with the rock platform. It was a chilling reminder that sometimes, the most innocent adventures can intersect with the darkest aspects of humanity. That bushwalk in New South Wales was supposed to be a simple outing between friends, but it turned into a haunting memory we'll never forget. My husband's extended family lives in New Brunswick, while his parents moved to Ontario and raised their kids here. Eventually, my in-laws retired back to New Brunswick, about 1,400 kilometers away. So, my husband's maternal grandmother was sick for a while. His parents got the call one night that she had taken a turn for the worse, and to come right away. They literally packed and left Ontario right away, and were driving down across an old old logging highway in the middle of New Brunswick, 
See my older posts for a short gif of the desolate road, when a moose ran out onto the road and reared in front of their car. They stopped the car, and the moose walked up to the windows and looked into the cab, literally leaving breath on the windows. Eventually it walked away. They get to the hospital in the middle of the night only to find out that grandma passed away, exactly at that time. Fast forward 30 years. My husband's mom is terminally ill. Her kids and grandkids have convened in New Brunswick for her last days. For several days before her death, we come home from the hospital to find moose tracks in the driveway, especially around the windows of the house. My husband's cousin has to go back to Ontario, and leaves the hospital to get ready. Within an hour of this, my husband's mom had passed away. Fifteen minutes after her passing, I get a text from his cousin, a picture of a moose standing beside their garage. Never before or after has anyone seen a moose in the yard. Went on a five-day gold panning trip with a couple buddies of mine. We drove six hours down unused logging roads. We're talking totally overgrown roads with trees having to be removed from the road to pass. We saw not one human the entire time we were out there, except for on the third night. At 3 a.m. We are sitting around the fire, drinking some beers, swatting at bugs, and shooting the shit when I hear a something. I look over and notice some light in the trees. What the? It's a truck, driving up the logging road we had cleared ourselves to get there, at 3 a.m. The truck gets up to where we are, pulls into where we made camp, a small turn-off spot for logging trucks. Sits there for 10 seconds while we all kinda stare in shock at one another. I get up and start walking towards the truck to say hello and ask what the heck they are doing out at 3 am on abandoned logging roads. When the truck just backs up, turns around, and drives off the way it came. The guys just drove 6 hours down logging roads all through the night, sees us and leaves without saying a word. We are all sitting there going, uh what the f? We all figured this guy was driving down the road, getting out and coming back to kill us in our sleep. Next morning we head down the road and nothing, they didn't set up camp or anything. Just left. We figured we were likely camped out near a grow up for one of the gangs. Hell's Angels most likely. And they were coming out to check who had come out to their spot, or they were there to pick the crop in the middle of the night. I've told this story before, but never to anyone I loved so deeply. So, here goes. In the fifth grade, I was a huge scaredy cat. The dark absolutely terrified me because I had an overactive imagination, and in those silent, pitch black moments, my mind would just conjure up the worst possible scenarios. So, one night, I woke up in a cold sweat, my digital clock displaying 2 am in its eerie green glow. As I peered over the edge of my bed, I saw what I can only describe as a figure garbed in a blood-soaked red rope. Its face was obscured by a large, golden mask that reflected the dim light from the moon outside. It was a sight that still haunts my dreams. The figure stood there, silent as a grave, just staring at me from behind the mask. I laid there for what felt like an eternity, my heart pounding in my chest. Then, to my sheer terror, it dropped the mask onto the floor, revealing a grotesque face underneath. The face was pale, almost luminescent, its eyes too big for a human, and it wore a sinister smile. As if this sight wasn't horrifying enough, it started laughing, a cold, menacing laugh that echoed around my room and seemed to penetrate my very soul. For about 10 agonizing minutes, the figure faded slowly, still laughing, until it was gone, leaving me in the chilling darkness. Frozen by fear, I stayed in my bed for what felt like an eternity. Then, adrenaline kicked in, and I bolted from my room, racing to the sanctuary of my parents' room. Of course, they were as terrified as I was, though more for my state than the story I recounted. The next day, my parents asked Officer Dan, our neighbor and the town's most trusted cop, to come over and check things out. He was the kind of guy who'd seen it all, 
a comforting presence who never dismissed anything, no matter how far-fetched it sounded. I remember sitting there, nervously picking at the threads of my sleeve as I relayed my nightmarish experience to him. People have told me in the recent past that what I experienced sounds like sleep paralysis, but I distinctly remember sitting up slightly, rubbing my eyes, and then seeing that horrid figure. To this day, the memory of that red-robed figure sends shivers down my spine, and sometimes, in the dead of the night, I still feel the echoes of that cold, menacing laugh. But having someone like Officer Dan around, even if just to hear me out, made it a bit more bearable. Last year I was with a buddy of mine and we were going to do the Heart Creek Scramble in Alberta, but due to some health conditions he has it was going too strenuous to complete and we figured we'd make it an easy day and just do the simple trail. Now we're both climbers and have been to Heart Creek for rock climbing in the past and had a great time so it wasn't a surprise to see the sporadic climbers on the mountainside as we went. Heart Creek is also pretty popular and easy for people who just want to go for a nice nature walk and maybe have picnic. Anyway, so we walked in, enjoying the day watching climbers on our way by. We saw a couple even doing some multi-pitch climbing which means basically leapfrogging up the route. We settled in for lunch about a half hour later and left a couple hours after that. On our way back I remember seeing a climbing shoe in the creek and thinking oh, Someone must have lost this. I picked it up when my buddy got my attention and I looked further downstream. Both climbers, a young man, 29, or so, I learned later, and his partner were both lying the creek bed, rope and harnesses still attached, dead. It was very surreal, we had seen these people climbing not two hours before, making their calls, having a good time. The first reaction I had was that I remembered that there was a family right behind us, a husband and wife with a young daughter who were playing in the creek on the way down. We ran back and stopped them and explained as quietly as we could what was ahead and before we knew it, Looky Luz had come by. It turned out that the husband was an off-duty or CMP officer and so he took control of the situation. I learned later we weren't the first on scene and that the authorities had been called. It was a very quiet ride back into town that day though. Edit, I have more details if people are interested. Real edit, holy crap, sorry all. Okay, more details, so the couple who were climbing were both experienced enough, but one was still learning they attempted to do a dual lowering maneuver using each other's weight and feeding the rope through their belays. One of them made a mistake and lost their end of the rope and that was it for both of them. There wasn't a lot of blood strangely and they looked very peaceful. I didn't get a good look at the girl I mostly only saw the guy there. The story ran for a couple days in the area, talking about the male as the family of the girl didn't want to disclose anything. That was not something I thought I'd see that day that's for sure. I'm going to peruse the comments for any specific questions. This is a story my uncle told us when he was younger and my cousin was just some months old. I was around 15 or so, he was explaining it to my father and looked actually scared about it. For what he told my father and I heard there myself, he had been dreaming three to four times with the same old woman and his daughter. The woman had bright red eyes, and in all his dreams she heard his baby one way or another. So just a nightmare, which sucked, but whatever. Some days later they go around town with their baby, and took some photos. And when a couple of weeks later my uncle went to get them developed, he got a nasty surprise. In one of the photos of just the baby playing on some grass, there was an old woman at the background. The light had made it so she had red eyes, and my uncle sworn up and down it was the same woman that appeared in his dreams. And then his wife pipped in that, indeed, there was something strange there because she could have sworn they were alone in the park while taking those photos. She didn't seem to believe it was that scary, but she hadn't noticed the woman at all, she said. They spent a week or so staying with us until my uncle decided it was his imagination and they went back home. Two years later his wife tried to kill him while he was sleeping with a knife and tried to go after their daughter, 
but that didn't have anything to do with it. Turns out having schizophrenia, not saying anything to your boyfriend even when he turns into your husband, stopping taking your meds and your whole family deciding to lie to that same husband saying you were perfectly fine is not a good idea. My buddy and I had a tradition of hiking deep into the backwoods where human footprints were few and far between. A silent, serene world where our conversations were the only disturbance to the constant symphony of nature. That's where our story begins, way out there, with nobody in sight. One particular evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, I began to gather some wood for a campfire. Picking up sticks here and there, my eyes landed on a stick that stood out from the rest. It was about five feet long, about three inches wide, the perfect size for a walking stick. Excitement coursed through me as I picked it up. It was straight and mostly smooth, the ideal companion for long hikes. What was really surprising was that one end was smoother than the rest. A thought bubbled up in my mind. Had I stumbled upon a fellow hiker's discarded walking stick? My fingers traced the meticulously whittled end, admiring the craftsmanship. But as my eyes took in the details, I realized, with an escalating sense of disbelief, that it wasn't a handle. Not even close. It was, unmistakably and irrevocably, a penis. A phallic masterpiece carved into the end of this seemingly innocent stick. I was holding a literal dick stick. My initial shock quickly morphed into odd fascination. This wasn't just a quick, crude job done out of adolescent boredom. This was a work of art, carved with purpose, precision, and, bizarrely enough, affection. The details were intricate, right down to the carefully etched veins running along its length. Whoever had created this had invested hours, if not days, crafting this unique piece of art. Stunned, I showed it to my buddy, whose wide-eyed expression mirrored my own. We burst into laughter, the echoing sound a stark contrast to the silence of the surrounding wilderness. There, under the stars, we shared a moment of surreal hilarity, the product of someone's bizarre pastime. From that day forward, our hikes took on an extra dimension. Every stick picked up was scrutinized, and our campfire stories had a new, undeniably strange, champion. The forest, it seemed, held secrets far more peculiar than we could have ever imagined. I work in the outdoor field and lead trips regularly. I once led a trip to the top of Mount Stringer in North Carolina. It's a tough climb to get to the top and about six miles from the nearest road. I was leading a group of eight middle school kids and had one co-instructor. We were camping out on top of the mountain and it was a beautiful night with a full moon. The kids and the other co-instructor went to bed in their tents. I chose to spend the night in a hammock that night. I was really into a book I was reading so I stayed up and read until about 10.30 pm. I turned my headlamp off to settle in for the night. Everything around me was rather bright from the moon and from the position I was in, I could see down the trail we had hiked to get to the top. I laid there enjoying the scenery and noticed something moving on the trail. Bears are common in the area so I perked up. As it got closer, I could tell it was a person. We were in the middle of nowhere and there was someone hiking up the trail with no headlamp or any gear. I was just frozen watching this person move closer to our camp. They arrived at the top of the mountain where we were and just stopped. I watched as what appeared to be a man surveyed our camp. I really could only see the outline of him. He stood there for what seemed like 30 minutes but may have been 10. He then turned, sat down under a tree facing our camp. He was sitting up in a way that I knew he wasn't trying to sleep. He just sat there staring at our camp. I had no idea what to do. I decided to wait it out. I waited, just staring at the man while he stared at my camp. This went on until about 3.30 am. Then, he stood up, took a moment to survey my camp a few minutes longer and then went back down the trail he came up on. I, to this day have no idea what that was all about but it freaked me out. I was paranoid that we were being followed for the rest of the trip.
I was 18 and was going to a friend's, say, Mike, house with another friend of mine, let's call him Joe, on my bike, motorcycle, to be clear. So we reached this friend's house, which was in first floor. We tried calling him out from the street. His moms came out and said he wasn't home. We started again from there to another spot, where we and a couple of other friends hang out. Just after we start, Joe tells me to go the same spot that I had in mind and I tell him, I had the same thoughts too. Now we reach the spot and almost all of our friends are there, as expected. I had a tiny little chat which barely lasted a minute and then noticed that Joe wasn't behind me. I concluded myself that he was playing me and asked the guys where he was hiding. They had no idea what I was talking about. I thought of pranking them all back and decided to leave the place so that Joe would have to walk back home. Couple of hundred meters later, Joe walks towards me from a completely different direction. I was completely blank cause I'm the only one with a motorcycle and nobody else could have dropped him there from the spot. I asked him how he got there. Joe, I got down at the Mike's home. When you started, I was screaming for you to stop, but you just kept going. I was like, who was I talking to then on the way to the spot? The solitude that comes with living in a national park can be both intoxicating and haunting. I spent three months as the sole human inhabitant in one, a seemingly endless expanse of nature that was both my home and my sanctuary. The experience was mostly peaceful, the silence broken only by the sounds of the wind, the trees, and the occasional wildlife. But there was something else that often punctuated the quiet, music. It was a melody as soft and tinkling as a music box, or perhaps a distant ice cream truck on a hot summer day. The peculiar thing was, it always seemed to echo from somewhere above me, a melody floating on the breeze, an auditory illusion that was both fascinating and slightly unsettling. One day, driven by curiosity, I decided to track the source of the enigmatic music. I followed the dirt road that wound past my humble trailer, guided only by the elusive, ethereal melody that continued to waft through the trees. But as I ventured further, it was difficult to gauge if I was getting closer or if the source was just as elusive as before. My eyes were fixed on the treetops, straining to locate the origin of the strange sounds when my gaze was drawn downward. A snake lay stretched out in the path ahead. I stumbled backward in surprise, but the creature made no move. It took me a moment to understand why, the snake was dead. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked around and saw that the snake wasn't alone. Half a dozen dead copperheads lay strewn across the road, their lifeless bodies all aligned in the same direction. It was as if they had been journeying somewhere, only to be simultaneously struck down. Fear snaked its way up my spine, replacing my curiosity with a primal instinct to retreat. I couldn't bring myself to step over the ominous assembly of deceased serpents. Turning around, I rushed back to my trailer, intent on using my car to navigate past the eerie spectacle. But as I fumbled for my keys, the music abruptly ceased. The ensuing silence was almost deafening, filling the space the melody had previously occupied. The sudden stop seemed to echo the strange, unsettling event I had just witnessed. Despite my numerous walks afterward, the music never returned. The only reminders of that day were the silent woods and the memory of the bizarre, serpentine gathering on the road. The experience became another secret shared between the park and me, an enigma that underscored the underlying mystery and magic of nature. This started as early as my childhood. I'm reckon I'm what my religion or community describes as special. I have the ability to see the paranormal. However, I'm taught to be as logical and scientific as possible since young. I often try to explain my special encounters as reflection of light, my eyes are blurry, bad lightnings. So let me tell you a bit more about my vision since young, often then not I see black mists slash figures. And I can't exactly see their facial expression just a vague human-like body covered with either black or white cloth. And they merely appear for a blink of an eye. 
However, this one incident had me convinced that truly, whatever I have seen, encountered was not just my imagination. In my Asian community, we tends to stay at our parents till we are married or whenever we are financially stable of affording one. Houses in the Asian community are not cheap at all. So being a college undergraduate, after working on my thesis till 3 a.m., I decided to call it a night, switch on my night lights and get ready for my night reading. Halfway through, a white figure with a distorted face and lengthy hair came floating into my room. I definitely had my window closed since I lived in an air-conditioned room. It was staring at me as it make its way to the side of my bed slowly, gently and silently. Fear intertwined my every cells, my body unable to obey my commands. Her bloodshot eyes locked with mine, and abruptly, she let out a eerie shriek for a minute or two, and disappear into thin air. My parents upon hearing the shriek came rushing in as I burst into tears. Till this date, we have no explanation whom it was or what's its purpose. Working the night shift has a way of skewing your perception of time. Before you know it, the world is celebrating Christmas and you're just finishing up work at 1 am. That's exactly where I found myself one Christmas morning, about to embark on a six-hour drive north to spend the holiday with my parents. This wasn't a bustling cityscape, this was the rural South Island of New Zealand, a landscape punctuated by small towns and vast stretches of untouched nature. It was the kind of place where traffic was sparse on a regular day, let alone at 1 am on Christmas morning. Throughout my drive, I passed only a handful of cars, fellow night owls making their own solitary journeys. About halfway through my trip, I reached a stretch of road that was truly isolated. The mountains seemed to reach out and touch the sea, with the narrow road carved into the cliffside. On one side, the towering cliffs rose into darkness, on the other, the roaring sea crashed against the rocky shore, its ebb and flow a steady soundtrack to my journey. It was on this remote road, some 20 kilometers from the nearest town, that my headlights illuminated an unusual sight, a man, walking in the middle of nowhere. The pitch black night, the eerie sound of the waves, and the intermittent sea fog created an almost otherworldly backdrop to this lone figure. What made the scene even stranger was what he was carrying, a cheap blow-up doll slung over his shoulder. There were no houses in sight, and given the steep mountains and the proximity of the sea, it was clear there were no suitable places for a dwelling until I reached the next town. This man was truly in the middle of nowhere, and his presence was inexplicably unsettling. Friends have since asked me if I stopped to see if he needed help, suggesting he might have been left behind by someone. But in the face of that bizarre spectacle, under the vast expanse of the starry sky, with the relentless sea as my only companion, there was no way I was stopping. I drove on, the image of the man and his blow-up doll growing smaller in my rearview mirror. Even now, the memory lingers. A lone figure in the darkness, a curious anomaly against the rugged beauty of rural New Zealand. I still don't know who he was, or why he was there. All I know is, that six-hour drive was the longest I've ever experienced, and I'll never forget that Christmas morning. Lived alone in a sub-basement flat once. A lot of weird things happened that I put down to the fact I was constantly tired from working split shifts six days a week. Honestly if it was something else it was actually super helpful. I'd come home knowing I really needed to put a clothes wash on and when I got in I'd find my clothes were clean, that kind of thing but it was happening a lot. I really thought that my schedule was so messed up that I was doing things and not remembering doing them so I was more concerned that I was losing my mind than being haunted. Anyway, the thing I really can't explain away is the time I was lying on my couch and I noticed something catching the light on a glass panel on the door, got up to look at it and saw it was a kiss mark. But basically from that moment on I was finding them all over the place, on mirrors, on the other doors, even on the stove top, basically any shiny surface. 
I may have been washing clothes without remembering but I definitely wasn't going around kissing things in my flat. Oh, and also I would often find my front door wide open, despite being sure that I'd locked it or at least shut it, which made me think that maybe a living human was getting into my place and doing weird shit. When you move to a new place, you expect surprises. New faces, new paths, new experiences. But when my brother and I moved into our new house, we discovered something we could never have anticipated. The house was nestled against expansive backwoods, an open invitation to exploration and adventure. Being nature enthusiasts, we were thrilled by the opportunity to have our very own wilderness to traverse. We laced up our boots and decided to explore our new playground one sunny afternoon, not knowing the chilling encounter that lay ahead. Our hike led us into a quaint open grass field, a startling contrast to the dense woods we just navigated. An island of green amidst a sea of trees. There, in the center of this unexpected meadow, was a figure hunched over in a blue jacket. We assumed it was a friend we'd made recently. I didn't have my glasses on, but the familiar blue jacket seemed a good enough sign. So, with a grin, I jogged across the field, excited to surprise our friend. As I approached the figure, I soon realized our mistake. It wasn't our friend. It was a man, a stranger. He was crouched over the carcass of a deer, brutally jabbing at it with a blunt stick. The sight was macabre, a horrifying scene framed by the serene beauty of the meadow. I froze in place as the man raised his head, his eyes meeting mine. Fear took hold, adrenaline pumping through my veins as my heart pounded against my ribcage. I turned on my heel, shouting at my brother to run. The joyful exploration had turned into a terrifying chase as we sprinted back through the woods. The memory of that day still sends chills down my spine. The tranquil beauty of our backwoods forever marred by the unsettling encounter. We learned something important that day. Our new home held surprises all right, but some were far more disturbing than we could ever have imagined. I remember the day as clear as a bell. My girlfriend and I, hungry for adventure, decided to take on the Appalachian Trail. We weren't through hikers by any means, just a pair of carefree spirits looking to experience the rustic charm of the wild over a three-month period. We were far from civilization, hadn't seen a soul in what seemed like forever. The isolation was just as we desired it, an escape from the urban frenzy. As I led the way, my eyes caught sight of something peculiar. It was a large brass eagle, strangely abandoned on a tree stump. We were miles into the wilderness, the nearest town a distant memory. The weight of the eagle spoke of its authenticity, it was a random token of human civilization in the midst of untouched nature. It seemed to be the first in a series of unusual items we encountered that day, each one more inexplicable than the last, discarded as if part of a breadcrumb trail. That evening, we arrived at a shelter. Our relief at finding a place to rest was quickly overshadowed by the unsettling presence of the shelter's lone inhabitant. He was an old man, his disheveled appearance and his walking staff, topped with a baby doll's head, gave off an immediate eerie aura. With only two levels in the shelter, we opted for the top, leaving the ground floor to our disconcerting company. The night was long. Any attempts at sleep were interrupted by the old man's rambling tales from his past. He spoke of his days as a cab driver in New Orleans, his voice echoing through the wooden shelter. His stories took an uncomfortable turn when he reminisced about passengers engaging in intimate acts in the back of his cab and how he would watch them in the rearview mirror. It was a disturbing disclosure that hung in the air like a bad stench. At dawn, we couldn't wait to distance ourselves from the shelter and its eerie resident. Before leaving, we left him some power bars, his haggard appearance suggested he needed them more than us. He probably had schizophrenia or some other mental illness, I thought, as we quickly retreated down the trail. Our encounter with him was a chilling reminder that the wilderness wasn't just filled with physical challenges, but with mental ones too.
It was a usual day in Missoula, Montana. The sort of day that begged you to lace up your hiking boots and lose yourself in the majesty of the surrounding mountains. I lived in a house tucked away at the foot of these ranges and found solace in their imposing shadow. After perhaps 45 minutes of arduous uphill hiking, without a path to guide me, I stumbled upon something that broke the rhythm of nature's harmony. It was a cage, but not one designed for trapping or hunting. No, this one was large enough to contain 5 to 10 average-sized people, standing erect. The structure was constructed with round steel bars defining its edges, the walls, and ceiling were crafted from robust ropes instead of conventional chain links. It was cleverly concealed, resting just on the far side of the ridgeline, invisible to anyone who wasn't directly upon it. The isolation of the cage was both puzzling and unnerving. Looking around, I noticed the ground was undisturbed, no footprints, no tire tracks, no signs of recent activity. The cage seemed oddly pristine, the ropes intact and undamaged. It was as if this cage had appeared out of thin air, serving an unfathomable purpose in the heart of this vast wilderness. A chill of apprehension ran down my spine as I studied the eerie structure. I felt a primal instinct kick in, urging me to leave the area and distance myself from this unsettling discovery. I had stumbled upon a mystery that, perhaps, was best left unsolved. Regretfully, I didn't have a camera with me that day, this was two years ago, and I was only out for a day hike. Over time, the memory of that cage has only become more enigmatic, a strange enigma amidst the natural beauty of the Missoula Mountains, a story that I now share with a sense of bewildered unease. I was camping and hiking in the Okefenokee Swamp. We, my girlfriend and me, were far from being the only ones there, but when we woke up one morning we took a canoe out in the swamp to explore. It was early, there was a thick layer of fog resting just atop the water. The whole swamp was completely still. No animals in sight at all. We paddled down the waterway for a while and saw nothing else. Not a single person. Not a bird. Not anything. We didn't hear a single sound. We had just cornered a bend in the swamp and we hear it. The loudest guttural bellow I had ever heard in my life. I could feel it echo through my chest. A true dinosaur sound. We stopped paddling and looked at each other a little creeped out. We knew it was an alligator, but we had never heard one that loud. We both looked behind the canoe and behind us the backs and eyes of at least 20 alligators had risen. They had just surfaced out of nowhere. We slowly start to paddle forward and we hear more bellows. They came from all around us. In front, behind, to the sides, sounds emanating from the bush-covered banks. Each glance behind us we saw more eyes appear. More scaled mounds breaking the water's surface. From the banks in front we would catch tails sliding into the water, ripples of these huge reptiles broke the water all around us. We looked back again as we paddled faster. Easily 40 alligators behind us now. And we began to see them appear in front. 10 to 15 huge lizards seemingly blocking our path. Then, one of the largest alligators I have ever seen surfaces right where my paddle was going down. I hit the beast on the back of the head and the thrash he made was incredible. When his massive head hit the side of the small canoe I thought we were going in the water. Water came into the canoe as the side dipped down. The beast disappeared below the boat and we held steady. We paddled forward as fast as we could, right into the dotted landscape of scales and eyes. Behind us, that same guttural roar echoed through my body. As we cut through the field of eyes and backs, we started to see the path clear. The huge monster that had almost capsized us bellowed one last time. We turned as we made it past the last of the animals and we could see the monster staring at us. Watching us leave. All the other alligators began to sink to the water's floor. The big guy stayed there watching until he was satisfied we had gone, I guess. Then he disappeared without a sound, back into the black murky depths of the swamp. We banked the canoe further up the waterway, got out and just sat around for a while taking in what had just happened.
The heat of the New Mexico sun beat down on me as I set off on a solitary hike, eager to explore the vast wilderness while hunting for hidden geocaches. The vast openness was a sight to behold, but the true allure was what was hidden in the wild, waiting to be discovered. After a few hours of navigating through dense foliage, I found myself in a clearing. There, I was met with a sight that seemed out of place in the serene wilderness. Half-built and crumbling concrete structures were scattered around, their skeletal frames of protruding rebar piercing the clear blue sky. A dirt road, untouched by recent rains and worn by tire treads, cut through the clearing, leading in from a direction opposite to the one I had come from. The site was oddly chilling, a ghost town in the making, forsaken mid-construction and left to crumble in the otherwise untouched wilderness. Signs of recent activity, footprints and freshly discarded trash, hinted that the site was still frequented, adding to the eerie atmosphere. It felt post-apocalyptic, a relic of civilization left to decay among nature. Alone and unsettled by the unexpected discovery, I felt a twinge of unease crawl up my spine. The thrill of geocaching took a backseat to the creeping sense of dread permeating the area. I decided to abort my hunt, choosing to retrace my steps and leave the uncanny site behind. It was only later that I discovered the truth about the site. It was, in fact, a battleground for paintball tournaments, designed to mimic an urban warfare environment. There were no signs of spent paintballs or colorful splatters on the concrete walls, leaving no clues about its real purpose. This explained the seemingly misplaced urban decay in the heart of the wilderness. Yet, knowing its purpose did little to diminish the eerie impression the site had left on me. Its incongruity with its surroundings served as a stark reminder of how jarring the hand of humanity can be amidst the beauty of nature. I was with Outward Bound in Utah for three weeks. Majority of the three weeks you are with the group, but for one to two days you go on a solo or whatever they call it. They give you enough gear and food and plant you in a spot. You're not opposed to leave for any reason, if you have a problem you blow the safety whistle and someone will come, we were pretty much just out of line of sight from each other in the group. So I get to my spot, set up shop, and walk around my area a little bit. I then find the mangled and decayed husk of an elk not 50 feet from my sleeping bag. It had been there for a month or two, and there was barely any meat left on it so the smell wasn't that bad. It was very clear that something had been eating the elk. The skull was three feet away from its spine, the legs were gone and the rib cage was smashed. There aren't too many things in the wild that can do this. It could have been a black bear, but they are skittish and I could just yell at it and it would go away. Brown bear, if it was hungry I would be in some serious shit. Coyotes, not that threatening because I am not a small dog or cat. Wolves, least likely as I don't think there are many left in Utah. Mountain lion, F me sideways if it decides to come back. Most carnivores don't want to travel great distances to hunt for food, so they stay close to their food supply. Most importantly they don't haul the catch of the day back to the wife and kids, to my knowledge only few animals do this. So if you find a kill of a carnivore you are probably not too far where they live. Now sleep tight. Alone. In the darkness. Knowing that the animal that killed the elk isn't that far away from you. While you sleep. Alone. Defenseless. I grew up in the concrete jungle of Brooklyn, a place where buildings scraped the sky and cars filled the streets. My eyes had only known the grays and blues of concrete and steel, the occasional splashes of green in city parks, and the vibrant diversity of urban life. The sight of an actual forest, a densely wooded area filled with trees, was alien to me. When I was a young teen, a friend decided to introduce me to the more natural side of Brooklyn, the trails in Prospect Park. We ventured away from the hustle and bustle of the city and into the serene woodland trails. The sheer contrast was unsettling, if not terrifying. The silence was an unfamiliar melody, a far cry from the incessant city noise. 
The towering trees cast long, menacing shadows, making the woodland seem eerily dark and haunted. Just as I was coming to terms with the uncanny surroundings, something caught my eye that sent a chill down my spine. A white face, a girl's face, peered out from a thicket of bushes. Her eyes were wide and vacant, her mouth open in what looked like a silent scream. It was as if she was frozen in the throes of absolute terror. Instantly, all the horror stories I had heard about deserted woods flooded my mind. My heart pounded against my chest as thoughts of the worst scenarios crossed my mind. Had a psycho serial killer dumped a victim's body here? I stood, petrified, my breath held as I tried to process the sight. It took me a good 30 seconds to realize the truth. The girl's face belonged to an inflatable sex doll, oddly discarded in the bushes. It was a bizarre sight, and though it was far from the gruesome scenario I had imagined, it still added a strange twist to my first experience with the woods. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.